Good morning, Austin. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. We are calling to order Commission Meeting Number 285 of the Massachusetts Game Commission on Thursday, January 9th at 10 a.m. here at our offices um, at 101 Federal Street in Boston. We'll begin with Item Number 2, the approval of the minutes. Commissioner Stebbins. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, included in your packet is the meeting minutes for the December 19th meeting. I would move their approval subject to correction for any typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Second. Any discussion, suggested edits? I had one. Um, on page three, uh, bottom of page two, uh, 1043, it talks about um, the materials that we discussed at the last meeting, the IEB uh, use of information. But I think we, we really came to a clear um, consensus. We gave direction not to use that information. I don't know that that's clear from those notes. Just the note at 1043 or carrying over to the top? Well, I mean, the whole, it could, it could be in it, just, just the fact that there was a consensus that we um, not utilize that information at all. And I, when I read this, it just wasn't clear to me that that's what our discussion it's, really. It, you're, you're correct. I, I agree with that uh, that point. And I think that was if a, we a could consensus. Just maybe add a line about well, And also just, uh, it's what's not really reflected in here is my um, <laughs> lack of comfort with taking that approach all the way up to the highest level in terms of the, the executives. Yes. I would like that reflected that I actually would prefer there be an exemption when you go up to the highest level. That's right. It was not a unanimous consensus. But right. Yes. right. Uh, we'll have these on that yeah, we'll, So we'll go back, relook at that, put those two items on. Uh, <coughs> Commissioner O'Brien's concerns and the more granular where you guys came out. Right. Yes. Um, I would then suggest, because it's obviously meteor content, that yep. just the typographical correction or non material matter. So we've, um, we'll just uh, table that motion yes. and uh, we'll look at uh, the revised minutes at our next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. And moving on to item number three, the administrative update. This would be Executive Director Bedrosian's last administrative update. It, and I think there are here, there are cheers through the Commonwealth on that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't believe that's the case. Uh, so let me do a couple things. I do have some uh, uh, comments I'd like to make. But first, um, one housekeeping item, um, maybe for a little bit of discussion purposes. I think at some point um, last meeting, you had suggested potentially going out to Springfield to do a meeting in February. Um, I'm going to channel my inner Janice Riley here um, just to say I, I think there are some legitimate purposes. I understand the uh, substance behind it. The risk is uh, with the weather this time of year, we uh, commit to a room, commit to streaming services, we pay for those whether we use them or not. Having said that, um, I think there are some legitimate scheduling substantive issues. I just want you all to be aware of it before we committed to signing contracts. I think you we were talking about the last week of February. Uh, John, I don't want to put you on the spot, but we were looking at the end of February for the um, commission meeting that possibly would be held in uh, Springfield. And <clears throat> there were reasons that we thought that made sense. Of course, what we're concerned about is in the event of a, a snow day, we might have difficulty getting there. And there is a somewhat significant cost associated with uh, the vet, you know, maintaining the venue and our streaming. And there's just a slight risk we might not be able to retain the space. Exactly. So, should we take that risk right now um, and 
and not necessarily uh, sign the contract. Yeah, I, I would just like to add, we, uh, the local and John will help me fill in the right name if I get it wrong, the local historic preservation trust of which has done uh, some projects in Springfield with money provided by, I think, through the community mitigation. Uh, was interested in showing us around as some of their projects. Mm -hmm. That would be outdoors and maybe walking around between the convention center. So I hope we would be able to add that to our schedule the next time we're in Springfield. But again, it's just one more thing to think about uh, weather-wise and doing it in February. To be clear, we're all hardy New Englanders. <laughs> we are. We are. Uh, but we just want to be, we do want to be smart about the commitment. If what if we took the risk of, of maybe losing the space ideally on that date and and wait just a bit? Does that make sense, Marianne? Are you? The th th that was what we had planned on. And and we might be able to um, see what the options are of putting a temporary hold on it with a commitment by the first week of February. See if they would go for that or not. I think Marianne just said you've never had a problem getting the room. It is, doesn't, doesn't mean it can't happen, though. So. I'm OK waiting, yeah. uh, especially if there is uh, the potential for uh, the matter to be resolved in, in the early February. Uh, we, could, we could still try to schedule something at that time. Sure. So I, I, I'd say let's hold on. That's right. for the time being. All right. Thank, Thank you. you for raising that. That's direction. So with that, I would like to comment on my last day. Um, I started the commission in January of 2016, almost exactly four years ago. My first public meeting was January 7th. That was public meeting 174, and as the chair said, today is public meeting 285. Uh, by the time I started, I had already accomplished an interesting goal, and that was to have a job interview with a subsequent discussion about my qualifications streamed live on the web. Um, I re <laughs> recently rewatched that meeting, and thanks Did to you? our website, it will <laughs> live on forever. Um, I loved my confidence at the time. <laughs> Looking back on it now, I think it's a good thing I didn't know what I didn't know. Um, but I appreciate the opportunity commissioners gave me as a novice to this industry. I know some of you inherited me, but you all supported me, so thank you very much. I want to recognize former commissioners McHugh and McDonald, who were also very supportive of me, even when they weren't at the commission. I also want to credit former Chairman Crosby. He had the courage to embrace transparency and push many of us to a point that was outside our comfort zone, for example, establishing agenda-setting meetings, of which we've had 68. He also championed the request of the legislature to allow the commission to exempt service, certain service employees so that most of the people that could have an opportunity to be employed in this industry could be employed in this industry. Thanks, of course, to my family for supporting me during this adventure. My wife has pretty much supported every decision, pretty much supported every decision I have made, and I thank her for that. My kids never completely understood my job especially when I could not give them any inside tips for casino nights at their schools. <laughs> uh, I can't begin to say enough about staff here. I would love to list all the individuals, but time prohibits that. Except for my own assistant, Mary Ann Dooley, sitting right behind me. She put up with me for four years. She gets a shout out. Um, what staff has done during my tenure is nothing short of incredible refining our regulations, opening two major casinos while ensuring diversity and opportunity in the construction and operation of job, licensing and doing backgrounds for thousands of people entering this new industry, while studying the impacts of the introduction of casino gaming in Massachusetts, and offering mitigation <laughs> grants, being literally a worldwide leader on responsible gaming, and conducting a major investigation under appropriate scrutiny 
at the same time keeping re racing going, revenue collection going, our own HR and technology staff keeping going uh, was nothing short of incredible. And as a leader, my job was literally to stay out of their way. <clears throat> Thanks to the men and women of the Gaming Enforcement Unit for helping with background checks and public safety at the casinos. Thank you to all our attorneys, both in-house and outside counsel. We've had our share of legal challenges, which have been handled both professionally and successfully. I want to thank other state agencies, DPH, the Lottery, the Attorney General, EOTS, and also our appointing authorities. There are many other regulators who are incredibly helpful to us, generous with their time, allowing for staff visits, allowing for calls. Um, owe them a debt of thanks. This commission of staff work day to day under the appropriate public scrutiny. Our, our communications team is best bar none. I also want to thank the press, those who attended our meetings in person, and some who watched via the web. You, most of the time, appropriately held our feet to the fire. <clears throat> there were, oh, I, I'm sorry, I also want, like, not least but last, I do want to thank our licensees. Uh, while we are the regulators, our relationships have been professional, and for a newbie to the industry, they were often helpful and respectful at the same time. Um, there were a number of challenging times, and maybe not the most obvious. Uh, I will remember the day in January of 2018 when I saw a tweet from the Wall Street Journal about an article involving Steve Wynn literally followed up seconds later by a phone call from Jackie Crump. But for me, I'll remember the day uh, I got a call that one of our senior uh, gaming agents who had spent the day helping us prepare to open MGM Springfield had gone home and passed away. That was a tough time. But I am most impressed through all the challenges commissioner and staff alike have taken their jobs both incredibly seriously and with a good dose of humor. I've been privileged to serve as your executive director, and I can't thank you enough for the opportunity and support. I wish you all the best and good watching your future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now, <coughs> all of your, uh, my fellow commissioners do want to chime in right now, but I think we're going to respect the agenda. I can see Commissioner Cameron see motions, um, and if you want to, you know, make our short comments <coughs> now, then we'll move on to uh, the next part of his report. No, it doesn't matter when we speak. But I just, yeah, that was touching. That was moving, and to mention uh, an agent that we lost. Um, yeah, that's a motion. Mm -hmm. So we'll hold off. That's fine with me. Back Hard to the regular scheduled program. Program. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> the erosion tool. All right, that's what I like. Um, so thank you. So we do have an ongoing issue, one that will, I assume, uh, uh, exist beyond me. Um, our draft region C RFI and request for public comments. As you know, we've had this. We've kept the tempo on this to try and get this resolved. We've had this on the agenda for a couple meetings in December. Uh, the last meeting, we um, talked about a series of questions. Uh, Derek, Todd, and I put those in a draft RFI. Elaine helped us put uh, our format um, for draft public comment questions. Um, I had circulated those individually to commissioners and gone back for comments, and I did get some comments on some potentially follow-up questions that have also been included in the package. So I think um, what we would need is potentially some discussion about the draft RFI, um, whether we want to include any of the follow-up questions or not. And then Derek is here um, to answer any process questions about the RFI. We obviously would need to think about dates, about when you'd want to post it, how long it would be out there for. Um, and also that same goes for the uh, public comment aspect also. Um, if I, I can just start with the public comment part of it, since it's probably shorter. Um, Rereading it and um, looking at the bullets, I, 
I feel like the third bullet down is a question of law that's really not appropriate for inviting public comment in this venue. Um, I'm, I'm pleased with the others, but I do think that the, the question about whether Section 91 of the Compact impacts our authority, I just don't think is an appropriate question for public comment. <laughs> I agree with that. Mm, makes sense. Okay. You know, I mean, I mean, is there yeah. the consensus we should take out uh, the Section 91 question? I got, I I got three, if four. You need a mo if you need no, a mo, I, I, I think I have one. I'm, I'm counting <laughs> yeah, the no, Bobby that makes sense to me as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, plus there's, you know, the, 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 the immediate um, bullet uh, gets to perhaps the point that we could hear from re regarding the tribe, <coughs> which is yes. how those dynamics, you know, um, play and, you know, uh, et cetera, some of which we've heard before as well, but uh, it's, it's good to have it uh, again this, this time around. So I agree that we should just delete that. And as we know, interested parties will let us know what's on their mind, regardless of the question. Right. Yeah, I would. I would. You know, you have a kind of an open-end uh, piece to this down at the bottom, which is the deadline for comment submission. I I would just recommend we keep it open. I mean, folks have certainly, as, as Commissioner Cameron just alluded to, they always weigh in. They always come through MGC comments or through, you know, a hard letter into the into the members of the commission. Uh, I would leave the date and time open. We might come back at some point and say we're going to close it, but... So the only, the only thought I would have on that is a deadline sometimes spurs input. So maybe we should have something like preferred deadline, something, you know, something that incentivizes people to respond. I, I hear you, and <laughs> I and I understand that, you know, deadlines, you know, like April 15th for taxes always drives people to get stuff done. Um, you know, maybe, uh, again, only because this is a companion piece to yep. the RFI, and we're not quite sure where the RFI process is going <laughs> to begin to take us. Um, you know, I think a, a combination of, you know, our excellent communication staff kind of <laughs> promoting that the questions are out there may drive a lot of immediate responses without necessarily shutting anybody off. But uh, again, we've always been open, we've always been flexible to have comments come in from the public. I just think with this, it's, it's not really necessary to set a, set a deadline. Okay. Just one opinion. In terms of um, focus on the public comments, I, can we just put them aside if we don't have further discussion now, and then look at the RFI, and it may be that we go back to the public comments rather than say we're all set um, on them, just in case our next discussion on the RFI informs something you bring. Sure. Okay. Um, looking at the RFI. We do have um, the additional questions um, that were offered, and we have the draft. The, um, the booklet did include the additional questions, correct? It does, okay. mm -hmm. yes. Discussion? On, uh, can you show us everybody? Sure. I, well, I can, I can maybe give a bit of a of an overview of the, um, uh, the, the, the questions here, labeled as additional questions. Um, I, I contributed to them, and maybe uh, I can just um, summarize some of that as, um, in my opinion, there is not a foregone conclusion that, we will, that this RFI will result in a market study. Um, that's a clear possibility. Uh, I think there's a real business case uh, for us to examine in one way or another um, the current state uh, of the market, uh, but also go back and look at the assumptions that were made uh, when the market studies of 2010 and 2012 were performed. Um, so what I, what I think we are trying to do here is to frame uh, the discussion as uh, one of important time frame. Uh, is it too early to see, to tell what some of the dynamics were predicted at the time? Are, is it necessary for some of those assumptions to be revised? And how much of those, uh, of the factors that have 
ensued since then weigh in on, on what, we are, what we are observing, uh, whether it's additional expansion around us, um, uh, the, the uh, consumer preferences, uh, online gaming, uh, which may or may not in include gambling options, uh, either around us or available uh, in the marketplace, and, and, and so on. So, um, I, I, I would I would say that's sort of the theme of some of these uh, questions. Uh, I didn't want. I, I don't know that it's relevant to get so specific as to some of the details of those market studies. So. By necessity, they only address the totality of the market in New England and Massachusetts that was envisioned at, uh, at the time. Um, but I can, I can, uh, we, we can talk in more detail about uh, about any one of them. Um, I tried to also call out what I think we are seeing, um, and that is specifically only slots uh, revenues. Um, there's, uh, 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 I would like to have anybody um, who might be interested in responding offer insights as to um, whether there's uh, a dynamic here uh, that we're observing uh, that is only temporary uh, or whether there's a trend in a decline perhaps of slot revenues uh, because those games are, uh, are perhaps uh, changing in terms of consumer uh, uh, preferences. Um, so that was, that was perhaps the, the idea in, 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 or the themes in some of these, uh, some of these questions. So uh, <clears throat> there's certainly going to be some overlap between the questions that are presented in the RFI. Mm -hmm. So integrating it, the, these questions into the draft will take a little bit some artwork. Uh, do, in terms of setting aside the additional questions, can we turn to the, the draft for any particular discussion right, uh, in, in discussion right now on the draft? Uh, I do have some, some thoughts, but I want to defer first to, to you all. Well, also for the draft, I included one point, which which is at the back of the page of the additional questions uh, labeled for background. Um, maybe that should have been labeled for the introduction, um, and that is uh, perhaps an enhancement of what's already here, uh, where it describes appropriately that the Gaming Act allowed for or pr prescribed uh, up to three. Um, licenses in three regions with a minimum capital investment of 500 million and uh, a slots parlor with a minimum capital investment of 125. And um, to update that reality to what we have seen effectively uh, since then, uh, which is really, um, I should get that number right, a total of uh, approximately 3.7 billion in, in capital investment. Or, uh, or a premium, if I could term it that way, of 2.1 billion over what was then the minimum capital investment. Um, I think there are a couple of things that should be noted, um, which is, of course, that was a minimum. There was an expectation that there would be, uh, perhaps uh, with, with competition, there would be an increase from that. But I think it's um, noting that there was a significant, more than doubling, of the capital investment, I think, uh, perhaps frames what may be uh, hopefully some of the insightful responses um, as to what we may be seeing relative to uh, interest or, or, or the lack thereof, uh, as well as uh, indirectly the, the, the profitability of uh, and the ability to recoup investment uh, from, from private operators. Uh, does that so you would ask for a little bit of strengthening on the background with respect yes. to that point? With, with, with respect to that, which again I, I began to sort of note here, uh, you know, it's it's essentially updating what uh, what that paragraph talks about. And I don't have to uh, uh, really expound on that, but I do think we would probably want to strengthen the background so that uh, the the reason for our buy is, is very clear. Uh, 
uh, even including a little bit of a description of our current licensees. Um, one thing that I'd like restored that we had in, I think it's the memo dated December 16th, there was an outline, I'm not sure if it was completely comprehensive, but there was an outline um, of the relevant statutory provisions in that memo that we use as our roadmap. And if we could restore that in the background, that would be really helpful. Uh, you think that was in one of the December memos? It was in the December 16th memo. Okay. Uh, we probably want to look to see if it, it's comprehensive, if we could add to it. That's helpful. If we could add context um, as to why they're relevant, that might be helpful. So uh, would you like us to um, include some of uh, the suggestions from Commissioner Zuniga on the investment context and also the statutory references from the December memo? Right, and, and it might actually even warrant a little bit more history okay. to the extent it's helpful just to set the stage. Um, <clears throat> One, just a, a question for Derek. Because this is a hard process, with an RFI, is it appropriate to have a, an answer, a question and answer period? Because, I mean, we're asking for information, so I just wonder. So, so we contemplated this. The first draft that we had had question and answer, so we can put that back in. But. Do you want to explain that to make sure everybody understands? Yeah, so during, a, during an RFR process, um, you would, there are different options you can have. You can have questions and answer, you can have a bidder's conference, you can invite people in for interviews um, to get clarifications on points of view um, before you accept the final answer. But because this is just a request for information, okay. we left those pieces out um, because we figure if we do an RFR based on information here, or if we do open up a process or want further public comment, we can ask for that specific to the information that comes in. This is more of a fact gathering um, time period or information gathering time period, not a open for your response and then close the door based on that one time period of responses. Right, and there is, uh, and, and with even our public comment page, there could be they could request clarification, I suppose, even do that, even though it's relevant to the RFI. We always, we always accept public input. And given that this may or may not lead to a process later and we don't want to block anyone or conflict anyone out, I do think it's probably safer to not do the Q&A sure. and have any allegations that someone got a sit-down meeting in a Q&A that then put in a bid. I think it's probably cleaner to do the RFI without a Q&A. Okay, in terms of just a couple of uh, clarifications on the questions, just for discussion purposes, um, with respect to number one, I think one and three, there might actually be a little bit of a redundancy. So if we just ask what factors uh, you know, should, must be considered um, if we were to engage in a new market study, one prompt might be what other jurisdictions offering casino and possibly sports betting should we be considering? I think that you're, you allude to that, of course, in your new mm -hmm. questions. But and how how far do we do we you know reach? Uh, it's not necessarily obvious. Um, <clears throat> in terms of number four, we're looking at the time frame, and a prompt there would also be. A a follow-up question, what factors render a gaming market study stale, and what factors render a gaming market study potentially biased? Because we do have, it's, you know, we've heard publicly that there are studies out there that have been conducted in the past, you know, 2010 versus, and, and other interested parties have conducted studies, but I, if we could uh, gain some insight on that. That might be helpful. I don't know if we want to include it. Just a thought. Um, <clears throat> and then number five, it would be, what if any impact should be the potential introduction of sports betting here in Massachusetts? Because of course, what sports betting has been introduced um, around the country at this point. And we would presume that the, the sports betting um, of our neighbors would be included and looked at in number one. I'm really interested in 
also just for clarity purposes how we integrate the questions that Commissioner Zuniga has given to make sure that we have a, a clear document. I um, personally have been pushing to keep this process going, but I, I think probably that we could, we could authorize um, the staff to, to go <coughs> ahead without our, another review. I'm inclined to want to have another review. What do you think? I would agree. Mm -hmm. I, I think what I think we Commissioner right. Zuniga has offered, uh, you know, again, looking at the RFI process, we're looking for kind of some free help at this point. We're not limiting anybody to having to answer all of the questions. I think by adding more questions, we might actually get more consent. So I think the addition of the questions is, uh, uh, is helpful to the process and may even generate more responses uh, than originally uh, anticipated. Um, but I think there's, I think, Madam Chair, to your point, there's some wordsmithing that needs to be done to incorporate some things more into the background uh, and kind of see where we can dovetail questions a little bit, uh, you know, either subsections of taking your questions or subsections of the existing kind of broader questions. Uh, but I think there's a way to dovetail and you know, make, uh, make the document uh, more meaty and, again, maybe generate we don't have a, a, a full draft here right now, so I think it makes sense when we incorporate new questions with existing and see if there's overlap. There were some suggestions that are certainly more than uh, technical in nature, so I, I would concur that we, we could take time to see a, a new draft and then move forward. No, and we, we have been thinking for the next, you know, the next commission meeting, which is t two weeks, I think the commissioners will probably want to review it with a few days as opposed to just a day or two. Does it make sense to still, I, I would like to still see this be presented at the, in two weeks. Yes, if that, agree. Um, for our interim executive director. <laughs> That's her first assignment. <laughs> I think. I just want well, to I, I call her the presumed interim executive director. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I I think there's enough here that we could we could meet that uh, you know uh, that uh, quick turnaround. Uh, it does need more than just a cut and paste, but um, some of the additional questions fit uh, you know in in a subsections at least as sub questions on a couple of the initial uh, broad questions, but. Um, I think it's doable to come back next next week, um, next meeting, rather. So and, and I will. Oh. I had been working with this um, with Derek and, and Todd, um, and now I, uh, Karen will step in. Um, you will want a little bit of a beefed up uh, overview of Regency with more, a little bit more history, the statutory references, um, and some of the information that uh, Commissioner Zuniga uh, mm -hmm. suggested and have that blend in, obviously, with what we have. And then on the questions. Well, um, actually, before you move on, I think the chair also asked for more information on the actual current licensees to add texture to the market. Uh, OK. Thank you. Yep. And uh, in the statutory references from the December memo. Mm -hmm. uh, on the questions, um, uh, we will try and harmonize one and three and also integrate um, what yeah, Commissioner Zuniga's suggestions to give it a little, little bit more organic, make sure that the introduction of sports betting is clear about Massachusetts and insert a question about uh, the factors rendering a gaming market study either stale or biased. Uh, and then on the public comment, I think we had suggested um, potentially eliminating bullet point number three. And, and I did have one um, suggestion, and uh, forgive me because I, I had intended to, uh, prior to today's meeting, to get a little bit more information on it, but prior to my arrival, there were extensive public comments that were posted, I think in January, and I came in in February. Uh, they're extensive. I don't know what, uh, whether 
we should just go back and look at those comments to see if there's any public comment that you still would want. You, you issued this before. Is there anything <coughs> else that we want to reissue from these public comments to add to the public comment list? So maybe that could be circulated. Um, to, and then uh, either Todd or Derek or Karen could go to each commissioner and get um, any of those particular questions to be incorporated into the draft. I think that's appropriate within our open meeting law for you, for you to give us a suggested, and then it would come back to us in any case. Just a, a, a suggestion, um, Elaine was kind enough to give them to me, and I, I didn't get a chance to go through each one, and it would be extensive today anyway. You mean prior public comments to post them or prior public, public questions? Comments. But prior, prior questions that yeah, elicited the, those. Yeah, the commission, uh, I, I, I believe you must have decided on them. I don't know yeah. if the staff did Yeah, them. no. We, uh, but there are 12. And just, you know, given that we've already done that exercise and we're now reissuing a re request just to make sure something shouldn't be included. Right. And I think my memory is that was in conjunction with the motion for reconsideration process. Yes. Right. So we can it might, might not be yeah. relevant. We can, right. it may, it may, oh, we can go back and we'll go back and find those. Okay. So no vote, I got direction, no vote needed, thank you. No vote needed today. Any, any further discussion on this? Thank you and, uh, and, and thank you to the staff for your patience as we go through these iterations. And thanks. <clears throat> now moving on to item number four. The, uh, I know that, in fact, um, our acting council is out today, so thank you. Uh, Interim Executive Director, in, in, in at least under an informal process, Karen Wells. Thank you. Uh, we have um, our Chief Enforcement Counsel Loretta Lilios has worked with um, Interim General Counsel Mr. Grossman on a draft regulation for your consideration. Uh, so I'll turn that over to her just to explain what the process has been and the uh, language in the proposed regulation. Yes, good morning, uh, commissioners. So before you this morning are some suggested amendments to 205 CMR 134.09, in particular the last sentence of that subsection. Uh, these amendments, as you know, uh, came out of discussions at two of the prior uh, commission meetings where the IEB had asked for some guidance from the commission related to sealed records in uh, situations where the investigation revealed information related to a criminal matter that had been sealed, information that the investigator was lawfully in possession of, but the question being, as a matter of policy, should the IEB consider that information uh, as part of a suitability determination, um, again, information related to a criminal incident that had been sealed. Uh, you received input from uh, stakeholders in the form of some letters that were submitted and are part of the prior public record, and a majority of the commission previously directed uh, the answer to the question being no, the IEB should not consider uh, that information for suitability purposes. Uh, the amendment to the reg is designed to reflect uh, that guidance um, and uh, the IEB is appreciative for the, the clear guidance that had been requested that there be a, a, a method for clear application uh, of, of the guidance and uh, we're requesting that you review the language and uh, commence the formal promulgation process uh, on this regulation. Um, so if I could just, from a, an editing standpoint, yes. I think the sentence would read cleaner if we got rid of the passive and started the sentence to say sealed or expunged records. 
of criminal or delinquency appearances, dispositions, and or any information concerning such acts shall not be considered. I think the placement of the sealed or expunged is a little um, awkward there. And then the, the follow-up question that I have for you or for anyone else too is, in the circumstance that an applicant wants to discuss sealed or expunged, are they in any way prohibited or barred from this language? And do we want to put a safety valve in that the applicant can bring up such facts if they feel like it's relevant to suitability, but it's not something that IAB uses? And in the hypotheticals that we gave you in the memo, that was one of the hypotheticals, or at least it was discussed uh, in the memo that uh, one of the sources might be the applicant itself, him or herself. Uh, so it's been my interpretation thus far that even in that instance, um, it's indicative of overall forthcomingness but it would, of an applicant, but it would not be indicative that the applicant is not forthcoming since they are under no obligation to reveal sealed records or incidents related to sealed records. Uh, but if you think that would be helpful to clarify here. Well, I, I guess what I'm, what I'm hoping to clarify once we do this is just to make sure that to the extent that an applicant feels like the information is relevant to suitability, it doesn't bar the applicant. Or maybe we do want it to be a two-way street in terms of no one references it one way or the other. Or do we want to allow the applicant to be able to clarify some sort of conduct? I think nobody's barred. Sorry. I think nobody's barred from anything and we could make that assumption. But I think the regulation here speaks to the consideration. And I think that it should not be considered one way or another. So one way or the uh, other. Uh, I mean, I think we, we couldn't really have it both ways. I, I don't know if that's exactly what right. what is happening here. Um, I, I, I understand the scenario where, where it could be in favor of, of the applicant, but I think it's it creates more confusion, um, which was the, part of the intent was to really to clarify. Right. Um, I, I think, uh, if, if I may, I, um, I, I, we. We touched on this uh, also um, last time, but um, are we comfortable about the distinction between information and records? Um, because there was also the notion of um, we could obtain information by media searches or, or, or what have you uh, that may not be technically in the record, and this is where it gets dicey. Uh, and I would like to offer that, it, that we, what we really talking about here are, you know, is the information related to the records, included in the records, but it's really information. Um, and the, regu the draft language is intended to cover information. Already the statutes on sealed records say we can't consider the sealed records themselves. So this new language says that we cannot consider any information. Where is that? The last the last, the last sentence. sentence. The last Information sentence. concerning such mm -hmm. acts that have been sealed. Three lines this is in the bottom. Yeah, this is the part that we start clarification on. Ah, sorry. Yes. Mm -hmm. Be because before it was really just with respect to the delinquency, so we were only. And or sorry. any information. Great. But that works. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. However, I think if I heard correctly, Commissioner Brian, you're recommending a change. And if you could go over that more slowly. Sure, so certainly. I, I, I don't like passive voice. <laughs> I think it's oh, cleaner if we don't use it. And so it's, it's eliminating both the placement and the passive. So the phrase that have been sealed or expunged, I would say we strike that. And we start the sentence with simply sealed or expunged records of criminal or delinquency experiences, and then it would finish as written. OK. so. Uh, if we could, if you could indulge us and read the entire starting Certainly. records. Sealed or expunged records of criminal or delinquency appearances, comma, dispositions, comma, and or any information concerning such acts shall not be considered for purposes of making a suitability determination mm -hmm. in accordance with 205 CMR 134 and MGL 23K. That works. Do you, um, I, do you have any concerns about that? I uh, think that communicates what my understanding is of your direction and that 
such acts shall not be available as part of the suitability determination. Mm -hmm. I'm good with that. It's very clear. Very clear. Mm -hmm. I believe we need a motion. If we're satisfied, unless there's further questions for uh, Councilor Elias. <clears throat> we start, of course, with the, uh, the small business impact statement. Do you have any questions with respect to the small business impact statement? That's on, we're looking at uh, section 4A mm -hmm. first, and then we'll move to uh, the actual clarification of the regulation. Madam Chair, I move the Commission to approve the small business impact statement for the amendments to 205 CMR 134.09 as included in the Commissioner's packet. Second. Any questions on that? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. And then, <coughs> moving on to the, the actual clarification. Madam Chair, I'd further move the Commission approve the version of the amendments to 205 CMR 134.09 as included in the Commissioner's packet and authorize the staff to take all steps necessary to begin the regulation and promulgation process. With the clarification, With the, right? Correct. With, With the yes, edit. as amended. Second. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Thank you, and, and thank you for the uh, process, uh, both uh, <coughs> Director uh, Wells and uh, Deputy Director. Thank you. Uh, in terms of your work on this, the entire process was very helpful. Uh, it was incrementally done. We got very helpful public input. Mm -hmm. So thank you. It's a uh, critically important. Uh, part of the investigators' work, and we're glad to provide clarification. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on now to item number 4B, I through little three I's. We have uh, Justin Stepek and Dr. Leitbaum today on racing. Thank you. Um, so these regulations were before you back in early November uh, for their initial step in the propagation process. They're now back before you for the Final, uh, final draft uh, promulgation vote. Um, the racing regulations themselves will then, after today's vote, if, then, if approved, will go to civil legislature for 60 days pursuant to statute. The uh, regulation concerning the hearing process, which is our own regulation, will then be included in the next bundle that's sent up to the, uh, the, the registrar's office. Um, so we had our public meeting this morning with uh, to, uh, the public comment here. Sure, thank you, uh, Justin. Uh, during the hearing process this morning, the public comment was provided by uh, many of the stakeholders from the, uh, the Harness Racing uh, Association and membership. Um, some of those related to uh, some, uh, getting some clarification of definition, which I think Justin will be able to walk through. Uh, and there was also some concern about reducing uh, the time of an appeal from 10 days down to seven days, which uh, Justin addressed at the hearing, but I would also ask him to address it here. Uh, and then uh, questions around uh, appeal rights as to certain decisions by uh, 
judges and racing officials. So we appreciated the comment uh, that came in from our partners in the harness racing uh, community. Um, and I would turn to Justin to maybe offer some clarification. Sure. Let me um, let me start with the one that seemed to be the, the most uh, significant as raised by the Harness Horsemen's Association. That had to do with a what I believe is a, a misunderstanding that the somehow the appeal time for the racing appeals had been reduced to seven days. That is not the fact. What, what in fact happened pursuant to these regulation changes is we moved from what the racing section into our own appeals section. The timing of when the appeals are filed, it remains 10 days post uh, the racing infraction that the appeal is due. That's the way it's always been. We haven't reduced it in any way, shape, or form. It remains 10 days. So that was, that was the, I think, the first issue. Um, there was a, a couple questions raised about the definitions of individuals contained in the change to the racing regulation that addresses racing judges' conflict of interest. Uh, you may remember this from uh, our November meeting. We had, were implementing a procedure here whereby racing judges can be recused from judging uh, over races in which a family member or somebody of significant uh, relationship to them is involved, so we reduce it. And potential or actual conflict of interest. Um, so there's some questions about the definitions in there. Those, those terms are not pulled out and defined specifically because they're based on both the ethics statute as well as our own ethics, um, uh, enhanced ethics code. So we defer to those definitions. Furthermore, there's a sort of, there's a catch-all within that uh, regulation change which encompasses not only your typical immediate family members or your spouse, domestic partner, that type of thing, but also any there's a significant relationship whereby your uh, judgment can reasonably be questioned as to your ability to judge a race in which they were a participant. So I think that as it stands, it's not going to be an actual concrete issue that's going to come up. Also, we only have three racing judges, so this is, and there's a built-in degree of discretion there on purpose so that we can evaluate, so the ra racing director or whoever's viewing the situation can review it and say, okay, well, you know, is that actually a significant significant relationship and immediate family I would defer to the definition within the ethics statute as to what an immediate family constitutes so that's sort of our legal response to those issues we raised in the public meeting with respect to definitions um, the last one uh, that was raised came with respect to the ability to appeal uh, infractions that occurred during a race so this was something we removed the ability of individuals to uh, appeal infractions that occur during a standard red race. Um, this is the way it's always been in our thoroughbred regulations. Um, and this recently, what, as you may remember from last year's Kentucky Derby, this was a major issue of that Kentucky Derby race. Um, basically, the genesis for this particular regulation change comes from the fact that we hire experienced judges who have an expertise. We have three of them at Plain Ridge. Um, we, and we defer to their expertise. They're experts in the field. The, the, uh, if an appeal were to take place of something that, an infraction that took place during a race, often what I've seen happen and what has happened in the past is it goes up to a hearing officer who lacks as much experience as those judges who are, who are paying acute attention to what's taking place during a race. And sometimes it's a difficult thing to ascertain. And more often than not, what happens is there's a deference to the judge's expertise already. Um, so I don't know, Director Block, like I don't want to address anything. That's correct. That's the main uh, reason is your judges uh, or your stewards in the uh, program world are um, the experts, and they're kind of the ones who set the limits and all on, on those um, infractions. And um, we maybe get uh, one appeal of something that happens during the race, maybe every two or three years. And so uh, even if we always have the same hearing officer, they're actually watching a race maybe, you know, every couple of years, whereas our judges are seeing, you know, thousands of them throughout the meet every single year. And, um, you know, depending on their years of experience, maybe they've been doing them for 15 or 20 years. So um, the experience level is, is considerable. So um, can I take, well, can, just can I build on that? Um, so there has not been historically uh, uh, a regulation that prohibited an appeal on the harness race, but there was on the thoroughbred side, and that's just what legacy, maybe. 
Right. Just, you know, just the regulations have not been, you know, um, reconciled or unified or whatnot. Right. Um, tell me more about the history of, of on the harness side. Um, you mentioned one or two a year, but can you go back? No, one or, one or two every, we every don't have one every year. Yeah, we might one, have one or two every three or so years. Yeah. yeah. And maybe the last five years, maybe we've had two or three. And without a regulation, historically, what what would happen? So with our regulation, the um, driver could appeal to the, the hearing officer, and then we would uh, have a hearing, and, and um, they would show the film of the race, <coughs> and the judge would uh, describe what they saw and why they took the horse down, or, you know, um, imposed a fine or did a placing, whatever they, their decision was, and then the driver would discuss what they felt happened. And yes. why they shouldn't have been penalized. And, and, and the point you made earlier, uh, Justin, is that more, more often than not, the hearing officer has to defer to the judge who has the, ex or the three judges who had the expertise to begin with. Right. I mean, the practicality of the matter is our hearing officer is a hearing officer. They, they're not necessarily an expert on racing, in, in particular, the, the, they don't have the same level of expertise as a racing judge who, as Alex mentioned, may have 20 or 30 years of experience judging tens of thousands of races. So you have uh, our, our hearing officer being asked to second guess the, the, the opinion of three racing judges whose combined experience vastly exceeds their own. Right. And it puts them in an awkward position. And oftentimes, it's just, frankly, it's difficult because this is a specialized skill to develop, to see some of these minute infractions or, or to know when a particular you know, a wheel veers into the path of the other individual from a different angle. It's I've viewed some of these races myself. and. Uh, not as certainly not as many as any of these judges, and I have a hard time seeing it. So I defer oftentimes to what the judges are saying as well because I trust their expertise. Now um, I I also know uh, maybe this is a point you were going to make, Commissioner. I'm just uh, guessing here, but uh, the video technology since the since since Penn came around has was significantly enhanced and, and improved, um, which has had. I believe uh, a, a positive effect towards the uh, the questioning, if you will, of some of those rulings. Is that it is that have, the case? Uh, oftentimes, on that that very day, uh, even immediately after the race, if the driver has a question, um, they have the capabilities of play which now where they can the judges can show the film that they're looking at right down to the judge's office, the paddock judge down the paddock, and so the driver down in the paddock and the judges up in their stand can be looking at the exact same. It's resolved right there. Um, the judges will also, um, if they need more time, because obviously this is during racing, so every 20 minutes or so there's another race coming up. Um, if they need more time, the judges are more than um, welcome to, they'll have the drivers come up um, at a different time, you know, to up to the judges' stand to watch the different angles. And are there instances, or is it at least conceivable, that the judges, in an instance where the driver says, or, you know, I just didn't do it, or I just, I, I feel you're, you're being, you know, too punitive, whatever the case may be. Is, is there a case in which they reconsider? They talk among themselves, they go back and look at the video again, and, um, and say, well, yeah, maybe, maybe we're being too harsh. I don't know. Is that part of the process at all? They could, I mean, when, when they make that decision, they've already, you know, They've already conferred. Several different angles um, and taken, um, a, you know, an amount of time that they felt they needed to make it the right decision. But certainly, they listen to the drivers when they come in and show what they can, you know, show them what they felt happy. I, I think this is a, a good change. I like the consistency, of both breeds, um, the technology, and. and one thing that wasn't mentioned is all of these judges and stewards have been through a rigorous accreditation pro process where they have been, their skill has been tested in this area. Um, so I think this makes perfect sense and having seen how the judges operate, meaning um, collectively looking at that tape over and over again, I, I believe their, uh, their experience as well as their um, 
their process for making a decision is sound, and this is a good change. Um, Justin, real quick, there were just a couple other clarifications and definitions. Uh, question of director of racing, I'm assuming that refers to our director of racing. Uh, licensed association? Uh, in the uh, racing regulations, whenever the word association is used, that refers to the whoever has the racing license. So, like in this case, if you're talking on the harness side, it would have been uh, it's Plain Ridge. Right. Um, and then um, if Suffolk was racing, it would have been Suffolk Downs. So that would have been association. Okay. And directors of association was another clarification. Okay. So does that need to be clarified anywhere, or is that inherently understood if we don't clarify? That's understood. The association is the racing. I mean, from, from a legal standpoint, do we need to uh, define I, that, or no? I don't. I don't think so. I think I believe association is defined is actually in the definitions earlier on. I mean, it, it's 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 clear, and I, to the extent that it would ever be an issue, I, I can't I can't imagine a situation where someone where that would have a, there would be a legal obstacle to the actual definition of the association. I mean, it's, it's pretty clear in context as well, if, not, if it's not specifically set out via definition, but I, I believe it is in the definition set out. Um, can I go back to the significant relationship uh, point? Uh, and so it is really just the definition of significant relationship that, that gives rise to some of these questions or concerns. Is that the case? The, the, question, that came, the question that came up today at the, at the public comments was not the significant relationship piece. It was the definition of immediate family, oh. I think, life partner. It was immediate family and uh, clarity on spouse, domestic, or life partner. And, and my response to that is that I believe immediate family is defined. This, this all comes from our enhanced ethics code and, and yep. the ethics code in general, and I, I believe immediate family is defined therein. Yep. It, and, and even if you had to resort to the, the catch-all, we have a catch-all in our regulation change, which also includes a uh, significant relationship. So if there's a question about whether somebody was a domestic partner or a life partner, you wouldn't have, you, it would be almost irrelevant because you'd say, well, there's a significant relationship. It's a, um, another adult living in the house has been living in the house with this individual for X number of years. There's clearly a significant relationship there, whether you want to say they're a life partner, domestic partner, or something. Is there any need to uh, make make a reference around immediate family to our ethics code of conduct? If that's what we're pulling it from, I mean, we if we were going to do that, I mean, if we can def it, we can certainly go back and define immediate family if, if for clarity. If, if if you think that that's necessary, I'm happy to do that. It's a relatively minor change. We can come back before you on that particular reg and that particular issue. I. I honestly, given that this involves the three judges at Plain Ridge and their potential conflicts of interest, I don't see it as being a stumbling block in the future where someone's going to argue that this person is not a member of my immediate family. Because once again, if there was a, a, some sort of friction on that definition, you could say, well, in the opinion of the director of racing, there's a substantial relationship there. So even if there was some question as to say it was a uh, an in-law relationship, which is not technically part of an immediate family, you could say, well, but from what we understand, you have a significant relationship with this individual, so they may not fall under the umbrella of immediate family. However, they fall into the third catch-all of a significant relationship because of the nature of that particular relationship. So I'm, I'm happy to do that. If that's the, the will of the, the commission, we can do that. If I, I don't see it as a major issue, but if you do, I'm happy to go back and... and, and no, you, you had just raised the point about what you were basing that definition on reflected in the commission itself in its code of ethics, but I think that you explained it kind of uh, the overall viewpoint, the significant relationship piece tied to that. Can I just ask, is there a perfect parallel between immediate family and 268A and our enhanced code of ethics? For some reason, I feel like ours is a, is a yeah, I don't think they're a perfect match. Uh, I think, well, and they may not be a perfect match. I know in, the, in our enhanced ethics code, I believe we do define, I think we define Families. So this, we were, in, a, in certain ways, we're trying to mirror some of the expectations we have from a, from a conflicts of interest perspective into what we expect of our racing judges. Um, 
so that's where that language had come from. So if, if, if everyone would be more comfortable with me defining immediate family or referencing back to our enhanced ethics code, I'm happy to do that and just to, to, to tweak the, that aspect of that regulation in that respect. That's fine. Well, because I think there's two. One is, one is, I think, more inclusive than the other. And so I do think we need to decide, just even with the catch-all, I think we do need to decide which definition we want that to be. We, we could easily write in regulation as defined or illustrated in our And then pick method. either ours or 268A. In the event that we end up changing ours ever, it might be, because it sounds as though the policy goal is to make it consistent with both the state law and our enhancement. Sure, and I'm, I'm, I, I, can, or I could even go and make something even more specific as to the level of blood relation or consequentity or something like that, so it's, it's clear without referencing a particular statute. So, But is it, I think that it eliminates the need to further amend if we tie it to the reference to the enhanced code. Because then you don't have to keep going in and make oh. sure you've done the mirror change. Sure. You can just say whatever it says in enhanced code is the definition. That, so consequent is really I'm happy to reference back to the enhanced code, yeah. And we would be effectively treating the judges the same way we would treat everybody for the gaming commission. Right. As opposed to referencing it to the 268, right. which is low. I'm fine with that. Yeah, I'm just, we, we, I'm just, we, are, uh, we are subject to 268A, too. That's right. Sure. No, I know. I know. But. Yeah. Um, just the enhanced part. Well. Do, <clears throat> where does that leave us in terms of today? Do we so what we would do, the next step would be, I would essentially be a vote on everything except for that particular regulation that we were just discussing. So we would, we would, we would hold that regulation for me to make the change we just discussed. And we would have the final vote, which I believe there's a motion for, uh, on the 205 CMR uh, 3.00 sections, excluding this particular section, and uh, a vote on the 205 CMR uh, 4.00 section. But it would similarly that would exclude. There was a mirroring provision under 205 CMR 4 for the stewards. It's a similar ethical conflict of interest in identical language. So we want to pull those two out, not vote on those today, and simply vote on the, the rest of the package as under 205 CMR 3, 205 CMR 4, and 205 CMR 10102. So I can tell you those particular ones if you just want to craft the motion to pull out those particular uh, specific regs and, and hold those for uh, amendment. Um, that would be so 3.12. 3.18 and then 4.3? It's just, it's 3.18, 205 CMR 3.18 we would hold for the, for a, a change, and uh, 205 CMR 4.30 we would pull out for a change. Mm -hmm. So the others would all be for final vote today. I'm, that's, that's perfectly fine, I'm, I'm sure that works. Um, as a suggestion to make things more um, expedient, could we just agree to modify 3.18 um, the way we talked about? This, this was the one only about referencing the enhanced code of ethics, right? Right. It's something that we could amend currently and then vote on all of them. I'm just throwing out an option. So authorizing staff to make the appropriate no. correction that we just talked about? Yeah, so the motion it. just says, with the corrections we Precisely. mentioned, yeah. then move forward. And yeah, then that's move all of them. And that doesn't disrupt the regulatory. It would still be a finalized vote. Sure, that'd be perfect. Because really, it's, it's not terribly material. It's just actually substituting language that so we don't have to go back. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, yeah. that's great. That, that would I think that makes work sense. best, yeah. right? So. Saves a future agenda item. <laughs> So do we have a, a motion we'll take it um, step by step, but incorporating at least it, with respect to uh, 134.09, right? Reference uh, substituting the enhanced code of an appropriate section. Do you want to just repeat for the record the exact um, subsections, Justin? So the, the subsections that would uh, include the amendment reflecting a reference to the Enhanced Ethics Code would be 205 CMR 3.18. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
um, and 205 CMR 4.30. Okay. We, we don't need to make those, we don't need to reference that in the approval of the small business impact statement. We would need it referenced in the second motion, which is the regulation part of the problem. I'm seeing Shara shaking her. We do need that. I'll defer to I'll defer to Shara. Yeah. So. Shara. So. <laughs> yes, we should. So that would be. We do want to do that. And is that those are the two? Those are the only two. Yes. Okay. Okay. Is there any further discussion on anything else for uh, Justin and Dr. Lego before we move? Okay. Um. Madam Chair, I move the Commission approve the amended small business impact statement for the amendments to 205 CMR 3.00, specifically sections 3.01, 3.03, 3.12, 3.18 as amended, 3.29, and 3.35 as included in the Commission's packet. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Opposed? I have zero. Uh, I would further move, Madam Chair, that the Commission approve the final version of the amendments to the aforementioned sections of 205 CMR 3.00 uh, as included in the Commissioner's packet and authorize the staff to take all ne steps necessary to finalize the regulation promulgation process. As, as amended, right? As or amended. Or, 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 yeah. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Moving on to 205 CMR 4.00. Uh, Before I reference the wrong rec, my apologies. Uh, Madam Chair, I move the Commission approve the amended small business impact statement for the amendments to 205 CMR 4.00, specifically sections 4.01. 4.03 and 4.30 as amended as included in the commissioner's packet. Second. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Madam Chair, I'd further move the commission approve the final version of the amendments to the aforementioned sections of 205 CMR 4.00, uh, including amendments to 4.30 as included in the commissioner's packet and authorize the staff to take all steps necessary to finalize the regulation promulgation process. Any further questions? All those in favor? Oh, second. A second. Second. So, sorry. Second. Um, commissioner Sunika. And all those in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. And now looking at 205 CMR 101. Okay. There was no uh, comments on this regulation, right, Justin? No. no. So I'll move that the Commission approve the amended small business impact statement for the amendments to 205 CMR 101.02, as included in the Commission's packet. Second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero. And, and I further move, uh, Madam Chair, that the Commission approve the final version of the amendments to 205 CMR 101.02, as included in the Commissioner's packet, and authorize the staff to take all steps necessary to finalize the regulation promulgation process. Second. Any further questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero. Thank you. Excellent job. Very Thank comprehensive. You. Thank you. That brings us to item number five, Ombudsman Ziemba and our guests from Encore. Thank you. And um, our construction oversight manager, Joe Delaney, will be joining us in a bit. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much, Chair and Commissioners. We have two items on the agenda. Uh, the first item is a follow-up from Encore Boston Harbor's quarterly report for the third quarter of 2019. 
ending on September 30th, 2019. Although Encore Boston Harbor presented the bulk of its third quarter report at the commission meeting on November 21, there were a few items that were not yet ready uh, by that date. Encore Boston Harbor is here today to present on those few items and answer a few questions uh, that were asked at the November 21st commission meeting. Uh, as the predominance of the follow-up items relate to operational spending and employment, Director Griffin is also here for any questions the Commission may have. After the conclusion of the quarterly report follow-up, we will hear a status report on the documentation uh, of a number of commitments that remained outstanding when the Commission issued the operations certificate uh, for Encore Boston Harbor. At the time, Commission staff anticipated uh, that a majority of these commitments would be documented within the 90 days after the opening of the facility. Joe Delaney, Construction Project Oversight Manager, will provide the Commission with the status of these so-called 90-day commitments. Uh, Jackie Crum, Encore Boston Harbor Senior Vice President and General Counsel, is here to assist on both of these items. Uh, joining her today are Eric Krauss, Senior Vice President of Communications and Public Affairs, and Richard Pryor, Executive Director of Security and Investigations at Encore Boston Harbor. So with that as a general overview, I will turn it over to Jackie. Uh, good morning and Happy New Year. Happy good morning. Good morning. Happy New Year. So as uh, John referenced, we're here to give you an update on what we did not have yet available when we presented last November. So our first uh, slide is on the uh, compliance uh, aspect. So as you can see, the vast majorities of miners, 2,500 compared to 128, or approximately 5% were intercepted by our security team before they entered the casino floor. Uh, you had also requested a breakdown of where miners were intercepted, uh, slots versus tables, for example. We've included this information, but I'm not sure that there's sufficient uh, data for us to make any uh, inferences yet. So we'll continue to address, um, to address the uh, miners on the gaming floor at every level. We have, since opening, implemented some changes uh, to further prevent miners from coming onto the floor. And uh, Rich is here to answer any questions or to give you any more feedback on that information. Good morning. Um, do you have median times that they're on the floor before they're intercepted? The amount of times? Yes. Uh, if you go to the next uh, that page. Um, as you can see, it varies widely. So right. the, the uh, smallest one was two minutes, and the longest one for this period of time was three and a half hours. I guess we can talk about that one. Uh, as a department, we've taken robust efforts to prevent miners from getting onto the floor. As you know, we have nine entrances to the casinos. Um, our security officers have been trained not only by our own staff on ID checking, but the Alcohol Beverage Commission has provided training for us. We have issued every officer handheld Veridox machines to check IDs as they come by. And we currently have a plan, should be in place in about 12 weeks, to put Veridox machines, including passport checkers and ID checkers, hardwired into every entrance of the casino. And, and just to add to that, since opening, we didn't have stanchions up, so we had uh, crowds of people coming in at one time. And, and we found that people were hiding behind other people, pushing strollers. They couldn't be viewed uh, by our security officers. Uh, since opening, we've stanchioned off all the entrances so that uh, people are funneled and have to enter at most two at a time. So it gives the officers um, a lot more visibility into uh, the influx into the casino. We've actually these, reduced the number of entrances also. And these averages that span over the entire time period, is the number trending down as you get toward September, or is that? It's, it's, it's taking a drastic uh, turn down. It, Sometimes what happens, the very short ones are the people coming through past our security offices. They get up to the nightclubs where they have the hardwired Veridox machines where it's, they're better equipped to check and then they're immediately taken off the floor so there's no gaming and no drinking. That's the vast majority of people that get on. The number that actually game is very, very small. And just to reiterate Rich's point, for example, in our first week of operation, we had 29 miners um, enter the gaming floor, but only 10 of those miners were actually engaged in gambling or drinking. Could you say that again, please? Sure. So uh, in the first week of opening, we had 29 miners enter the gaming floor, mm -hmm. uh, but only 10 of those uh, were engaged in the gambling or drinking. Okay. So that number is a subset of the previous page. Correct. Director Pryor, um, 
do you feel like with this hardwired um, ID reader that that will um, enhance your ability to detect uh, false IDs? It will do it drastically. Um, the handheld checkers that we use are not always that accurate. Um, if there's a question as to an ID, we currently have to have a second security officer take the uh, ID to a pit where there is a hardwired Veridox machine to confirm or, or deny that it's acceptable. Sometimes that takes three to six minutes. Uh, with the new machine we have, it's actually, um, they call it toaster. We just take the ID, stick it in the slot on top of the box, and within seven seconds, it'll tell you if it's a valid ID. We have the equipment now. We're just waiting for the stand, uh, the podium. Podium. Can you just describe to me uh, where they're going to be stationed and how the crowd will flow through? Um, uh, the crowd isn't going to change, but before people get onto the casino floor, we're going to have these podiums. Right. Uh, they're just like they're the same thing that, that are in the pits. You can see the single stanchions in the pits. Same thing, but we've added uh, a new device um, that will take less than seven seconds. Plus, we're also going to keep the passport checkers on it. So but each it'll individual be each will instance. not be able to enter onto the gaming floor without passing through this device showing that they are not minors. Right. Some, some, we use an uh, um, Iowa Age to Purchase app on these devices also. And they're not, some of these uh, IDs are very, very sophisticated. Um, so the, the, machine, the current machines we have at the doors are not as accurate as the Veridox machines themselves. So we, are, we already purchased all the Veridox machines. We just need to actually make a large investment to put data at every, we have power at every entrance, but we need data there to use the Veridox machines. We're, within 12 weeks, we'll be up and running. We've already showed them to uh, Mr. Band and, and the rest of the group. And in the interim, the GU's been incredibly helpful in terms of uh, helping us run, run down some of these fake IDs, which uh, as Rich said, are, are very, very good fake IDs. Mm. Yeah, that's, great. that's that's the power of technology. I mean, I think, um, but you also, uh, it, it's also warranted with some of the larger crowds that, that you have at Anchor. As you can imagine, the number of colleges in the area underage, we reject at least 600 to 800 IDs a month. Mm -hmm. Do you have information as to um, if most of these individuals who got onto the floor um, that they did in fact have a, a, a false ID? Either fake or family members, that okay. where they look alike. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you talk more about when and the circumstances of the three and a half hour episode? Um, a minor got onto the gaming floor I don't know what day that particular one was, but they'll go to a table, and the table games weren't being thorough as to check IDs when they sat down, although they have the paradox in the pits. They were um, secure in the knowledge that anybody that sat down had already been checked at um, the doors. We met with the table games vice president and told them, don't be secure in that. If anybody looks under 21 years old, under 30 years old, before you deal them a card, um, make sure you check their IDs. So we have, we have changed our policy since opening because there was a presumption once somebody was on the floor that they had gone through security. We've now told people you can't assume that, so double and triple check the IDs. Uh, unfortunately, that's resulted in some customer complaints too because we have certain people who look young who are getting carded constantly. So what we've done to ameliorate, ameliorate that is we've offered, a, offered them a place where they can go and get a stamps so that once they have that stamp, they, they won't be continuous in card. We also are going to install the Veridox machines at every bar in every restaurant or bar that we own. It, it has been a learning process and an iterative process and we'll continue to um, adapt it as we see as we see the trends. But as, as my staff gets better also, I mean, ABC was great. Uh, they gave us some uh, very, very thorough training and we provided all the offices with flashlights to look for watermarks and so forth. So it is definitely trending down. Well, it sounds like you've taken uh, appropriate measures to, well, you took the issue seriously and you're taking steps to, um, to really reduce these numbers and we, we'd really like to see that happen. So uh, we're taking it very, very seriously. Uh, moving on to our operating spend, 
Uh, in terms of our spend, we had a total spend of about for um, I'm sorry for women, minority, and veteran-owned businesses. We had a total amount spent of almost ten million dollars, nine point eight million. On each category, um, we were a percent or two below our goals, and we're continuing to work out how we can uh, first identify and then um, develop a, uh, relationships with minority women and veteran-owned businesses. Uh, also, now that we're six months in, we are focused on going back and looking at our procurement to determine when, whether any of the items that we previously sourced from a, uh, from a Las Vegas contact or anything else, uh, whether we can do that locally instead. Uh, as you can appreciate, when we were opening, we wanted to make sure that we had the quality of goods and we weren't really in a position to start testing things. And I think now we're in a better position to look at some of the, particularly the, um, the smaller procurement items and see if we can source those locally. So you're just missing your marks, right? Your goals. Yes. But you've put in a couple of, um, you've changed a few things that you think might help. Yes, and uh, we are also in the process of um, hiring a new procurement manager, uh, and so that is, a, that is a focus of that hiring effort as well. We are pleased to report that 23.3 uh, million of our total procurement for the fourth quarter, oh, sorry, for the third quarter, or 49.4% of our total spend did go to businesses in Massachusetts. Uh, we're also focused on our spend in our host and surrounding communities, and we'll report that, uh, that those figures in our next quarterly report. Jackie, that seems like a very high number, the 47 million. I'm assuming that one that's biddable spend, but I'm also assuming in light of how close that was to opening, that was kind of a rush of stuff that you needed and that we may not see that figure every quarter. Uh, no, I'd we hope we won't see that. See that. Figure every quarter, <laughs> we hope we won't see that figure ever, every quarter. But yes, that was uh, sort of getting the initial uh, operating supplies and equipment into the building as well. Okay. Thank you. And, and John, could you remind me in terms of the total amount? Will we get a breakdown of where the rest is spent? Because I'm seeing 49.4 percent was in Massachusetts. Will we? going to break down eventually as a regular part of our template to find if it went to, for instance, any spend went to New Hampshire or, or elsewhere in the country. We've seen that with our other licensees. Can we? Well, as you mentioned, we're, we're taking a look at how we're going to synchronize those across mm -hmm. all of the licensees. Uh, we've referenced that we need to meet with the licensees yeah. to figure out, you know, what is the best way to do this uh, to make sure that all their systems work. Um, and we have yeah. to finalize our meetings with commissioners to see what their priorities are. And this is not to minimize, that question isn't to minimize, this is a, a great percentage, but I think that we, we are interested to learn, uh, if particularly if we can uh, encourage a supplier or vendor to recapture some business uh, that could be in Massachusetts, it's, it's really helpful. We understand that there's going to be some vendors that just don't exist in Massachusetts. Uh, so that's just a really helpful helpful input. Yeah, and I think for you guys it's more important because you have surrounding community agreements where, you know, it's clear in the language that best efforts are going to be made to hit certain targets, mm -hmm. uh, right. which might differ a little bit from our other licenses. Uh, I think to the chair's point, I mean, that information would yeah. uh, In fact, there was one instance just recently where we had a vendor who was uh, from Nevada who was supplying both us and uh, our, our locations in Las Vegas. And we've now located a vendor here that will be supplying both to Las Vegas and, uh, mm -hmm. and us here. So we're pretty changing soon. that around. Yeah, too. pretty soon Las Vegas will be asking for the information <laughs> that I just asked for. So that's excellent. <laughs> yeah. Good. Thank you. And also, uh, just a, also a follow up, um, as you're developing the the template. I understand you're working with Director Griffin in terms of uh, the uh, the diversity. Correct. That's right. Great. This is really helpful. Thank you. Uh, on the employment side, uh, we previously reported these numbers as of November 12th, and uh, we've continued to exceed all of our goals other than uh, women, which is currently at 44% compared to our goal of 50%. Um, we've also included a breakdown at the supervisor level, supervisors and above, which uh, largely resembles that of our entire employee base. 
Um, however, in an effort to improve these numbers, we've implemented additional training and leadership programs uh, so that we can make sure that one, we're recruiting more women and minorities, although our minority number is pretty pleased with where we are on that, but that we're also um, promoting them and making sure that they have the leadership and training to go into the higher level roles. Do you have this breakdown by department or by area? We do. And what is the breakdown in terms of her women in a smaller number of departments, or is it, it equal? It I mean, are there efforts to make it more yeah. equally distributed? It, it's actually pretty even across the board. Uh, the one place we struggle a little bit, Rich, is in the security, security department, and, and we are working on that, which has been uh, a great ally in terms of uh, trying to recruit women as well as promote them. And we have um, some wonderful leadership in the security department um, who I think is setting the example for other women. Uh, in addition, we've also formed, uh, this last quarter, we've uh, formed employee councils. Uh, these are councils that are comprised of employees and they're specific to diversity, women, and LGBTQ plus uh, employees. And, and the idea is that they will advise the leadership of the company in these areas and uh, hopefully design to further the interests of other employees that, uh, that have interest in these groups. That's a really important step is listening to your folks that are in that position and, and they can help you identify barriers uh, or concerns and they become your best recruiters if they are, if you listen to them and you value their input. We do and they've also been um, great in terms of identifying organizations outside of our organization that we can partner with, uh, get sort of ideas from them on how best to um, appeal to uh, to a very diverse workforce. Again, just thinking about the template um, for your use as we move ahead is, uh, you know, specifically you have the 30 mile kind of guideline for where you wanted to focus your hiring. So, you know, breaking those folks down by uh, the towns and municipalities. Not yes. 30 minutes, but 30 miles. 30 miles, yeah. yes. 30 minutes, 30 miles, same thing, right? No. <laughs> Depending on time of day. Uh, <laughs> Not that's been your, ex that's no, been your experience, right, Tess? Right. Um, finally, I, I wanted to turn it over to Eric briefly to discuss a recent news article regarding uh, changes that uh, we're planning to implement to enhance our casino beverage service. Thank you, Jackie. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good it's morning. Good to see you again. Um, first, before that, the affinity groups that you mentioned Commissioner Cameron are incredible ambassadors. I couldn't agree more. And everywhere that I've worked, um, including now Encore, they have served as really door openers for us, as well as watch out officers for if we are not in the right areas. And as Jackie said, um, groups that we can go out to. So um, we're going to grow on these. So, but. Um, the most recent news uh, related to our um, communication to our bartending staff that we would like to install automated beverage dispensers in the back of the house. So this is not um, consumer facing uh, automated dispensers, but in the back room, if you order a drink on the uh, gambling floor, a cocktail waitress or waiter would take your order and go in the back of the house, the bartender would be there. And the thought now is, after approval from the Gaming Commission, we would install and operate um, these devices. Last Friday, we told our um, back of the house employees that we were going to look to uh, operate these. Um, and uh, following that, um, a couple of the employees called the news outlets. And Saturday, uh, and up until this morning, we've been fielding media inquiries. Um, here are the facts um, that, that we have regarding that. Um, following the necessary approvals, we will begin to utilize these uh, dispensers in the back of the house. Um, what, and, and I think everybody here knows that the um, speed in which we can serve our guests increases, and in, in this case, more than four times what the current experience has been. And our guests and customers have told us straight out that uh, they've waited a significantly long time to be served, whether it's an alcohol or non-alcohol beverage, when they're on the floor. And we listen to our guests and try to make more 
applications to that. Um, there, un unlike what has been reported, there have been zero layoffs associated. These machines aren't operational, nor have we um, told any specific back of the house bartender he or she has lost their job. Um, any displaced employee, when these become operational, will be uh, will work with our team to find other employment that they're qualified for within the company. That's something we do for every job, that if you're displaced because of a number of reasons, we will work feverishly hard to find you work if you're qualified for that. Um, we told this employee group the exact same thing. We, to, to this morning, have no idea how many layoffs, if any, this action will take. Um, however, news reports uh, don't necessarily reflect what the current state of the state is. Um, and as you know, when we hire someone at Encore Boston Harbor, they go through a two and a half, three day orientation process. We invest significantly in every employee, regardless of job. And when someone leaves, um, other, for, other than for cause, it's a real loss to us from a resource standpoint, a time investment standpoint, and we really do a good job in hiring the types of employees we want to uh, keep. And in this case, we're going to work very hard for any displaced bartender to try to find other work. And as of today, we have nine openings on our website for bartenders right now. So if this were to go into effect this morning, nine, nine of those people would be filling those jobs that are open. So right now, I can't tell you how many people may or may not be laid off because of this, but I just didn't want the commission to think that 70 jobs are going to be lost on something that isn't important. But, but you made a decision to, to automate this, and you didn't have that information six months ago before those folks were hired that this technology, this automation was available and was maybe more efficient? I mean, the technology has been in use at other casinos and entertainment venues for a long time. Um, we opted to have employees back at the house to do that. However, one of the biggest concerns from our guests was in this area, and we tried to expedite their service and their experience, and this is one way to do that. I think this is the way that we've previously done it at other locations, right. and we thought this would be an efficient way of handling it here. I don't think we were as prepared for the volume um, here as we've experienced elsewhere, and the location, the, the distance that our uh, servers had to traverse uh, in order to get the drinks back. So I think when we looked at this, uh, not only from a guest perspective, but also from an employee perspective, a lot of our servers uh, we're complaining that it was taking too long for them to deliver guests uh, to deliver drinks to guests, thereby impacting their uh, tips as well. So I think we, we received input on, on both sides, and much like some of the other changes we're making, we're, we're learning as we go. And uh, you know. So one rec recommendation I would make in this instance, and, and as you can appreciate even from today's report, how much we value um, understanding the uh, numbers of employees at our licensees, that when there is going to be uh, this kind of a potential change that we learn of it um, somewhat more so in advance rather than even through a potential 100%. media inquiry. Yeah, that, that you, you, we couldn't agree more, it was an oversight. Right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, you know, particularly, uh, we worry about all positions but you, we know the legislature was terribly committed to making sure these entry-level um, positions are, are valued and, and given you know, careful thought. So uh, in this instance, we'll, we'll stay tuned. I respect Commissioner Cameron's inquiry, but we'll stay tuned because what I'm hearing is we don't know yet. Uh, and we're hopeful that these uh, valuable employees can be um, repurposed appropriately and, 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 and that they'll, they'll be happy. Right, and we will post to it when we get more clarity on exactly the number of jobs that could be lost because of this. I'm sorry if I cut you off. No, no, thank you. Thank you for that update. Um, I was just going to note that uh, the system uh, is existing in, in, at MGM. Uh, we, we know they implemented it from, from the beginning, 
and of course there's um, uh, that's that's the distinction here but I know that's part of the experience and efficiencies that you are trying to, to reach as well and if I could just address one more item uh, quickly okay. uh, with respect to the departure of executive director Vidrosian uh, as he mentioned, we've been through a lot, and it was not all easy. In fact, uh, most of it was not easy. Uh, but we couldn't have opened on time without his leadership. He's been a calming and thoughtful force and a passionate advocate of the, for the commission as well as for the licensees. So on behalf of Uncle Boston Harbor, I'd like to thank him for his patience and his support. I know I and we will miss him immensely, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Record noting blushing executive director. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for that. Any further questions for our, 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 our guests? Thank you, and again, Happy New Year. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So, Commissioner mm -hmm. Joe Delaney will join us for the second part of our agenda. Uh, Thank you, Commissioners. <clears throat> Thank you. Good morning. Um, so I'll be providing an update on the status of these so-called Encore 90-day commitments. Um, we initially presented these items at the June 27th, 2019 commission meeting, just at the time of opening. These were some of the items that were still outstanding as of opening that needed to be completed. Um, we gave you an update at the October 10th, uh, 2019 commission meeting where many of those items have been closed out. And uh, today you'll find in your packets a memo that outlines the remaining items to be completed at Encore. Um, so essentially, and, and the vast majority of these items have been done, I would say we're really down to some very nitty gritty kind of items here. Um, but essentially the items can be broken down into three main categories. And the first one is the environmental impact report compliance items. Just as a little background, when we wrote our section 61 findings, we not only required compliance with the Section 61 findings themselves, but also with all of the underlying documents that were used to develop the findings. So these go, these included all of the environmental impact reports, the final, the supplemental final, the second supplemental final, the, right, the notice of project change, um, all of the um, uh, secretary's decisions, uh, and. Uh, and uh, all of the uh, amended Section 61 findings. So there was, um, as you know, all of these documents total many thousands of pages. And as I'm sure you can imagine, cross-referencing and documenting all of these items is a huge amount of work. And I think we really kind of underestimated how much work that really is. Um, so what we're doing, you know, we're we're um, you know we're confident that all of the items that were required to be done were done because we were so heavily involved during the construction of the project and all of the documentation that was provided as part of the Section 61 findings and so on and so forth. So um, what we're doing is we're just working with Encore now to review these sections and to document any changes to the project and how those changes were approved. Essentially what we're trying to do is tell the story of how did some things change that might have been in an earlier document that may not be in a later document. And let me just give you an example. The city of Boston, um, at the time all of the environmental documents were completed, did not have a surrounding community agreement. So in our documents, we outlined a whole bunch of things that Encore had to do for the city of Boston, but it was without the city of Boston's concurrence. After everything was approved, the city of Boston negotiated a surrounding community agreement. And in doing so, they changed some of the provisions that were in the environmental impact. So essentially what we're doing now is going through these things and saying, all right, this, is, this happened, this is why it happened, these are some of the changes that were made because of that happening. That's one example, and there are multiple things in here. So, you know, the long and short of it is we're kind of chipping away at these things and trying to just slowly kind of churn through them. Again, not a huge high priority thing. I think this was a little bit of belt and suspenders approach when we, when we wrote this thing. But we have every confidence that everything has been done, but we're just trying to close these things out as we can. Um, so it's still going to take a little bit uh, longer to do that. Um, the second main item is the, uh, the greenhouse gas self-certification. Um, MEPA, Gaming Commission, MassDOT, 
Mass DEP, we all required this greenhouse gas self-certification. Um, Encore made a submission to me but shortly after the project opened, but when we reviewed it, it appears that some of the required backup documentation may have not been submitted to MEPA with that certification. Um, we, back in the fall, we had started working with Encore's facilities department on trying to close this, uh, close this issue out. But then there were some staff departures at facilities, um, which um, you know, hindered the completion of this work. Now, please understand, we're, in, we're fully confident that Encore has complied with the greenhouse gas requirements for the project. This is just simply a documentation requirement. So we're going to continue to work again with Encore to, um, and, uh, to, to ensure that all the required documentation has been submit, submitted to MEPA. Um, the third item is the DCR connector. As you probably remember, the DCR connector is the, uh, provides pedestrian and bicycle connection from Encore over to the DCR park next door on the other side of the railroad tracks. And uh, all the work on that project is substantially complete, but there are some punch list items that need to be completed before the required agencies can sign off. Um, these primarily involve just some additional looming and seeding in the spring. Now, with that said, you probably don't want to do looming and seeding before the beginning of May. So once that's done, then some submissions made to the agencies. It's still going to take a little while before that can be closed out. Again, we're not talking anything serious here. These are just these are just things that kind of happen on some of these construction projects where things extend out a little bit further um, than we expect. And with that, um, I'll take any questions. One point that I wanted to raise is that you know, we're mindful that uh, the folks at Encore had to open a facility. They have a lot of day-to-day -day concerns that they have to attend to. There are a lot of changes that they have to put in place to make sure that the facility is generating the revenues, generating the employment that, that are necessary. So we're, we're mindful of that. Uh, we know that they, they have a good understanding of why documentation of all of these commitments is important. Uh, but we're trying to find ways to work back and forth so whatever efforts that we can put forward to help them in this documentation uh, that will work out in the end. But um, uh, I just want to commend them on being mindful of, of why it is important to do the final documentation, but we do understand that there are some things that just have to take priority on a day-to-day -day basis, especially as you have organizations um, you know, that necessarily change. Just a quick question on the DCR connector. So it's it's not usable? I mean, some of the things... Oh, no, it's totally usable. It's, it's totally fun. usable. It's just kind of the final sign-off is regarding yep. some other issues that don't relate to the actual path. That no, you can use that. It was used on opening day, and it's been open since opening day. It's just, you know, there's hay bales and silt fences and other things that are still up there that have to be in place until everything is stable, fully stabilized and so on. Um, you know, they did some work on it in the fall, but, you know, there's still left, some left to do in the spring. But, yeah, completely usable. Well, I have to thank the, uh, you both for your uh, vigilance on this. Uh, we understand that things do take a practical turn, but you have been very, very methodical in in your expectations around compliance. I'm, I'm Jackie's going yes. Very, very methodical. <laughs> <laughs> and and so that's what you know, I defer to you on making these important judgment calls on. Can you just tell me on the Chapter 91 license, is that something, are we waiting for other other uh, state action from other entities or? So? This Chapter 91 license is just, they, they, a separate one was issued for the DCR connector. Okay. So until that work is done, they can't do the final sign off on that piece. It, okay. Thank you for that update. So unless there are further questions, that concludes our report. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. I think we'll go um, and have Director Griffin come forward now, and then we'll take a, maybe a 15-minute break before we move on to the last parts of our, of our agenda for today. Thanks, John. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. Good morning, Director. Good morning. I know. Oh. Still morning. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Still morning by a few minutes. So. Um, 
So um, for the second year in a row, um, last year um, we actually introduced the Casino Industry Impact Report. And um, we sought to capture the annual impact of this industry, this new industry, on career and business opportunities specifically um, for residents of the Commonwealth with a focus on um, diverse populations. Um, and um, so as we leave 2019, we're taking a look at 2018. Um, and just for, you know, I know you know this, but um, Plain Ridge Park had been operational for two years um, while two casinos were under construction during MGM opened its doors in August of 2018, and Encore's um, construction continued. Um, so we found that, um, you know, as you're um, doing this work, sometimes you forget. Uh, you're surrounded by the job opportunities, the construction, and um, we found it um, really gratifying to, to look back and see what actually happened, um, and um, what were the opportunities to um, people that live here. Uh, so highlights, um, and we looked at both construction and operation, operational jobs. 73% of these opportunities went to Massachusetts residents in 2018. Uh, 12,000 individuals found work in 2018 as a result of casino construction and operations. And if you look back to our report in 2017, uh, it was about 7,000. So um, we look forward to seeing how this continues. Almost 9,000 Massachusetts residents were employed in 2018, um, compared with 473 Massachusetts residents in 2017. The casino industry paid more than 385 million in wages, um, and more than um, uh, and Massachusetts residents um, in 2018 received um, a significant portion um, of those wages. Um, if you look at um, the industry's economic impact on business. Um, over 1.2 billion was spent with Massachusetts businesses in 2018. Um, and um, in construction alone, um, more than 72% of the contract dollars were awarded to Massachusetts businesses. Um, and um, nearly 55% of operating dollars went to Massachusetts businesses. Um, and uh, diverse owned um, vendors, um, the ownership uh, minority veteran and women owned um, companies also significantly benefited and you'll, you'll see uh, those figures. So um, part of the work of the commission was to ensure that these um, opportunities benefited um, local businesses and gave opportunities to uh, residents um, of diverse ethnic and uh, um, gender groups. And we saw that that happened. Part of um, how that happened was um, the programming support. The commission gave over $1 million in funding um, through grants and, um, and other sponsorships to focus on connecting individuals with these opportunities um, through the Community Mitigation Fund and, and other grants. So I think I will um, pause. I will say that um, I'd like to thank um, Crystal Howard on my staff who played a significant role on this project and really spearheaded the um, collection of the data. I'd also like to thank our licensees who 
uh, we're very busy opening casinos and other things um, during this time period. So. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to the commission for any comments or questions. Director Griffin, um, it, it appears to me in reading this report that these are good numbers, but you're more um, involved on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you feel like these are strong numbers? Do you see areas in which um, some of these numbers can improve? Um, you're communicating that, I suspect, to the licensees. Um, I think these um, numbers are very strong, very encouraging. Um, there are always areas that um, we'd like to see uh, do better, maybe in the operational um, procurement area. But I think overall, looking at 2018, um, the numbers appear very strong. Yeah, it's also very nice to now see the comparison year to year. Yes. Uh, I, I love the format. I'm reminded of the first report. This is now the second report, yes. if I'm not mistaken. Um, so it, it'll be good to um, to see, you know, how, how these trends, it's, you can, I can clearly, um, well, not so clearly, but roughly get a sense of what was going on and the, clearly the, the difference between 2017 and 18, uh, where there was only plain bridge is the entry in, in force of MGM. Right. And I'm sure we'll see, we'll see a, 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 um, you know, a, a similar um, impact, if you will, in the next, in the next one. Um, is there, and I know that there's a lot of sources for the data, but um, are there opportunities to get the next impact report uh, uh, perhaps a little bit sooner? I know, I know, it's, uh, I know. it takes a lot of time uh, collecting data uh, and, and, uh, and then combining it and making sure that it's uh, both the, the right data and compiling right. the report. Uh, yeah, so Commissioner, I think um, it shouldn't take this much time. Um, one of the um, efforts that we're working with um, Director Ziamba on is um, the reporting format and we're hopeful that oh. if we're collecting some of the right information that um, we don't have to go back to the licensee for everything. So the licensees um, submitted independent um, data requests. Mm -hmm. and we hope to make it a little bit easier for them. Mm -hmm. um, That's a good that. point. Yeah, that's that's a good point and something to look forward to. And it may also help um, efforts for the commission's annual report at some point if we can streamline the, the absolutely. Data yes. <laughs> no. Good no. One, right? No. Oh, absolutely. No. And, and this is this is the part where I was empathizing on right. how long it takes. Sometimes more than um, what we wish for, uh, but it's the nature of of the quality assurance, the data collection, and the sources and so. But on. if I could just add this last, we will likely need to go back to the licensees one more time for the next year and um, and I'll just um, thank them in advance for right. uh, providing that data in a speedy manner. Mm -hmm. So and we'll be going back sooner rather than later. Right. And the, the caveat of all of that, if I may, uh, is what I refer to as quality assurance. The last thing we would want are conflicting numbers in different reports. Uh, so it's important to make sure that we take the time to yes. corroborate and to reconcile where we're needed. Uh, it's just that um, there's a lot that also happened in this year that just passed that is not, by definition, not included here. Right. And that's the, the genesis of my, my question. But I, I, I love the, the, the format and, and I think it's a great effort. I, I would echo that. I think, you know, it's great work. I think obviously looking ahead to 2019, the construction piece is not going to be as, uh, as profound. Um, I, and I think that everything you talked about in terms of the template you're working with Director Zambon is going to allow you to pull this information together uh, a little bit quicker. I think the, the only suggestion I would really didn't hit me until I was looking through the numbers is that there's uh, also our licensees individual goals that are attached to this and I think that uh, Commissioner Cameron asked the question do you think these are good numbers I think they're great numbers 
and it'd be interesting to kind of overlay that with how successful they are. And obviously, they, they still have some challenges and others with respect to their goals. But you know, demonstrating that not only are the financial numbers strong, but their efforts to meet their established goals uh, have been met with uh, considerable success. So as you think of that going forward, also thinking, uh, you know, construction to a degree will be a piece of it because they do need to reinvest in their facilities. And that, again, won't be big numbers like we see here, but it will be gradual numbers, you know, in the years to come that will be reported on improvements that they make, the changes they make to the facility. So, but this is great work. Thank you. It's, it's great maybe going forward when we get more of the operational too, thinking about doing year over year chart comparisons for visual would be helpful too. Yeah. That, that would be helpful. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I think moving forward, we can um, perhaps work with um, our research team I think some of what you're collecting, they would benefit. Yeah. Yeah, and um, and then of course the the, the logical next uh, step in the analysis, um, as we get into year over year, is trying to ascertain things uh, like um, is is a particular uh, department uh, lacking in terms of women? Are there some kind of reasons? Is there turnover, for example, that bends one way versus another or across licensees that where, where, where maybe best practices can be shared or or, uh, or or try to get to you know ways to enhance the goals or really or, or rather or meet or, or, or exceed those goals um, not dissimilar to what you know you led with the access and opportunity committee where as as we get data and and, and begin to notice trends were, were relevant to, to inquire in more, in more detail and, and, and more uh, time and manner. Understood. Thank you. And just, uh, again, uh, this is such critically important information. The time in this matters. You mentioned one piece um, in response to Commissioner Cameron's uh, inquiry, where you'd like to perhaps see improvement in the operational numbers, of course, uh, do um, jump out at us. I'm not sure if you, because this is 2018, if we actually have those real numbers for 2019 because of our own work, your work, it might be um, interesting to see if we could at least get an update with respect to 2019 on the operational, if we have that. If it's going to be a heavy lift for our licensees, I don't think we should have, but if we have that, it would be interesting to see what 2019 reveals, mm -hmm. because that could inform you on some uh, proactive steps to really start um, supporting an expansion there. If it stayed static, if it expands, that would be great news. Mm -hmm. But I think my suspicions are you're going to see that that's still a challenge. And so it would just be helpful complete that portion of the story. If, you, if that is, in fact, an area that you um, identified as probably a, um, one where we could strengthen. And then I say we, your work, and we saw this with respect to the women in the, in the forum, and it's because of your work um, and the continuing reporting and, and those nudging, the nudging that you do that keeps everyone accountable. And it produces results that the licensees are so proud of. So it's so important. And our licensees uh, really focus and do great work in this yeah. area. I do think that which is not measured, um, you know the saying. So I think um, reporting and, and measuring uh, does help. Yeah. So yeah. We want to help them get that that great work out. You know, and it's through you. So thank you. Thank you. Any further questions for Jill? All right, I think that uh, I would um, ask that we take a 15 minute break. It is now um, 12.06, so let's say 12.25. 12.25? 12.25? Yeah, we'll take a 15 minute break. Okay. Is that a that sounds fine. Oh, yeah. were you thinking So we're not, um, we're not really doing lunch? I'm just confirming. 
Um, how There's angry one. are we going to get, Commissioner? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very hard answer, uh, question to answer. <laughs> no. Do we want more as a, more of a lunch break? Uh, Could we do 30 minutes? And, um, 30 minutes? Instead? Um, That's all I need for it. We are a bit ahead of our schedule in any case. Um, can we negotiate so it's 12 or 6? We return at 12.35 and that keeps us on our original schedule. Sounds okay, good. great. Sure. Excellent, thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon. We are reconvening our public meeting number 285, and we are turning now to item number seven on our agenda. Uh, <clears throat> I'll start the discussion. This uh, subpart A is uh, seeking ratification of action we took at our, our public meeting held last week on our agenda setting meeting. Um, as you know, uh, Executive Director uh, gave the Commission a notice of his planned uh, departure December 19th, and of course tomorrow is his last day. Uh, it, it <laughs> no, he gave notice to us December 19th of his intended resignation. Yeah, and so then um, we um, you know, had a couple of weeks during the holidays to reflect on that, and it, it, it occurred at least to me that we needed to um, announce an intention to appoint a interim executive director so that this last week Ed would have a partner to work with. And with that said, uh, we did say that we wanted it formally ratified and also subject to discussion um, at our formal meeting here today. So um, uh, Director Wells has been working with with Ed over the last week, and if we have any, if you'd like to discuss the merits of the appointment, I'm, you know, I welcome that now, and then uh, we would look for a vote ultimately. In <clears throat> well, I, I would just like to say I think it's it's um, certainly fitting and appropriate for us to um, to have uh, Director Wells serve as the uh, interim executive director. She did it once before. She did a very good job. She's been the number two in the agency. And um, I appreciate her willingness to step forward and say, yes, uh, I'll do this again and still have my, my other job as well. So I do appreciate that. And I'm certainly supportive of this interim position. Uh, I would echo that. I wasn't here on Wednesday. But I, I would echo those sentiments and just add um, that I also just think in, we were mindful of the fact that she will be doing two jobs and that to the extent anything needs to be um, moved around to, to support her in both, I think we just need to be aware of that. I would, I would echo both those comments as well. She, she stepped in uh, extremely admirably uh, during the transition from our first executive director and, uh, and again, just being mindful of the workload that her department has, but I know she's going to talented team underneath it that can help uh, pick up the slides. Yeah, and those were the nature of uh, the comments back in the agenda setting meeting when these happened that you were not um, uh, present, commissioners, and uh, there was clearly a, a, a consensus of three that she's up to the task and she will need the support uh, uh, of her staff and I'm sure they'll, uh, they'll, they'll bring it. Uh, but also were needed uh, the support of commissioners where we have done that in the past uh, early early on assumed uh, some ad hoc uh, responsibilities as, again uh, were needed this has always been a team effort and that's that's what we'll continue with one uh, uh, i think what we would want to uh, do now is is move on ratification i do want to follow up with a discussion around uh, because I'm, I'm hearing a consensus that I'm assuming there'll be a ratification. I, I would like to follow up that we, we do need to address compensation um, because she 
is going to be stepping up to a new position. Uh, we have done some preliminary uh, um, work on looking at best practices and and looking at whether there's any kind of potential rules around interim executive directors. We also thought if in fact there is a ratification, it would be fitting to allow Ms. Wells to actually have a say um, in, in um, the compensation discussions. So if we could uh, address just ratification today and then uh, in, over the next two weeks, perhaps Derek could uh, work with Enrique uh, to continue looking into you know, what other agencies with similar positions have done in the past just for guidance. And then we could be updated in, in our two weeks from now because I do think we have to set that in public. And you've gone through this before, yes, correct? Yes, we have. Mm -hmm. um, as difficult as it may be, it is, um, it's a matter for public discussion and, and um, a, a vote. So the preliminary first step today would be the ratification, but we didn't want, I wanted to mention conversation so you knew that it was on our minds. Okay. So Madam Chair, I move the commission designate Karen Wells, Director of Investigations and Enforcement Bureau, as the interim executive director until a permanent executive director is selected by the commission. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0, and we thank you for stepping up. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to say, you know, to echo some of the sentiments you said, that we have a, an incredible staff. We're a very high-functioning staff. So uh, the reason I was able to be successful in the last, the last time was the interim executive director was the staff really stepped up, and the commissioners, as Commissioner uh, Zuniga mentioned, were also very helpful. So I expect that same thing the, this time around because we have some really good people that really do good work and really get along with each other. Uh, and that's the kind of environment I'd like here at the, at the commission to continue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think <coughs> Executive Director Bajojan feels comfortable with that. I will be able to sleep tonight. <laughs> 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 so, um, moving on now to item uh, B. As I reported in our most recent agenda setting meeting, I have asked Commissioner Zuniga to assist me in the selection process for a new executive director. And when I say select, assist me, it's really um, handing over the the process as an assignment, but. I think that uh, Enrique and I have had a, a few discussions uh, after learning more about our obligations under the open meeting law through our attorneys, uh, our outside counsel. Um, the executive director position of the commission is a key one, we know that, one serving as the administrative head of the agency. And um, I believe you agree with me, Commissioner Zinga, that we want this process to be as open as an, and as inclusive of all of us here at the table as possible, consistent with the requirements of the open meeting law. And so it is our goal that the commission will remain informed of progress um, and all of us will participate in key decision-making points throughout um, the, the process. So, you know, if we think about incremental decision points, we can be involved and, and that way it will inform the process along the way. Um, there are three significant components that we've identified first, and that's determining whether we conduct the search internally or retain an executive search firm. The second would be preparing a job description and candidate profile that comprehensively and accurately reflects the needs of the commission at this juncture. And this could be conducting, uh, conducted using strictly internal resources uh, through the retention or through the retention of an executive uh, search firm or some combination of both. And then, of course, it's undertaking the search and the con conducting interviews and, and, and the final decision making, which we can go through at our next meeting in terms of that type of process, making sure that we're fully in compliance with our obligations of the open meeting law. Uh, at this time, I'd like to turn over the discussion to Commissioner Zuniga. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, relative to uh, 
how we go about uh, doing the, uh, the search, whether retaining uh, an outside firm or doing it purely with our uh, internal resources, uh, I'd like to point out a couple of things. Um, in the past, we've done it both ways um, for different uh, uh, reasons and in the timeline that we were and, and with, uh, with equally, I would argue, positive uh, results. Um, I would also note that um, even if we went with, in, in, the, in the event that we decide to go and try to get a, um, a search firm to assist in any way of the, the process, there will be important resources internally that will, of course, work uh, with, um, uh, with, with any firm that came from, from the outside. Um, clearly, our HR uh, manager and, and, and uh, Derek uh, you know, will have um, good insights and input into what we've done uh, in the past and, and, and the processes that we undertake for everybody uh, to comply with our, our own um, established um, uh, processes. Um, one of the things that I would note um, uh, uh, as well is um, there, there's perhaps uh, um, a little bit of uh, pros and cons into uh, how we go about doing this. It is conceivable that if we take on a, uh, an executive search firm, um, this could take a little longer in terms of doing a procurement, and I could get into that in a few minutes, um, because we also looked at existing state contracts. Um, but um, we would, of course, be the beneficiaries of an independent outside perspective. Um, I think, uh, as, 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 as you were mentioning, uh, uh, Chair, there, um, there is, we, we find ourselves in the life cycle of the agency that's slightly different. There's a lot to look forward in terms of more of a steady state operation and regulatory process. And, and that may uh, signify uh, us really thinking as to whether uh, that changes um, or not uh, the, the, the strengths that we would be looking for in, a, in, a, in an executive director, uh, or the attributes rather. Um, so I suppose the first, uh, the, the, the first decision would be to um, to engage or to, to think about engaging an outside firm. Um, I'll come back to the, the point I made, I was beginning to make earlier, uh, which is uh, Derek uh, looked at the um, existing firms under the state uh, contract uh, for professional services. Um, and you will chime in when, where, where, you, uh, where you think uh, is needed uh, here, Derek. But um, he went into the websites of 71 uh, firms? 73, uh, 73 vendors from contract PRF, 61 management consultants, program coordinators, and planner services, right. which covers any area that would um, do either evaluation of managers, training of managers, or executive searching uh, right. for managers. Right. And, um, I, I'll, I'll let you summarize uh, or follow up on this, but uh, the vast majority of those uh, firm, firms um, look to do a lot more of uh, consulting, uh, professional services, uh, something that um, if we were interested in engaging somebody to help us on what I would term the front end of the search, getting some kind of input internally or some kind of research as to what we might need, helping us write a job description or whatnot, and, 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 and select targeted um, associations or publications, uh, etc. You know, there's any number of firms within that contract that could help us do that. Um, conversely, there are, uh, there's very few of those uh, uh, previously selected firms that could help in what is really the term of executive search um, or headhunting uh, as, as is colloquially known. Um, there are uh, two firms that appear to do that and uh, the emphasis seemed to be more on either public safety or IT and I don't want to necessarily mix them up. So, so there were three. Um, one was solely public safety. 
other one was another one had a background in uh, health and human services and the third was more along the IT driven uh, industries um, it wasn't straight IT but it was they looked at managers who were going to implement major IT um, reforms in an right. agency and an organization. So those were the only three out of the 73 right. that did anything regarding executive searches or hiring. Now, to be fair, this has only been a uh, website uh, consultation. We have not spoken to any one of those firms at this juncture to ask or verify whether their emphasis is one or another or or, uh, or, or even ascertain whether they would be interested or have done this before elsewhere or in Massachusetts, um, which could be done or could point us towards if we wanted to go with the outside help of, of, of a firm um, for us to consider doing a solicitation, um, you know, issuing an RFP, uh, putting together, um, if that's what we, what we wanted, putting together um, the scope of work that we would want to um, engage uh, and, uh, uh, and in the meantime also be um, at a minimum posting uh, uh, or, or drafting what we might think is the, the enhancements or, or, or uh, revisions to the job description that we might need, etc. And just as, uh, to interject right now on that process, we have received advice that um, it, if we decided to go with the outside firm that we require a, a competitive bidding process, that that would be um, something that the parts could be done with all of the commission, which would be uh, through a vote of an appointment of a procurement management team, which could include one commissioner. And my recommendation would be for Enrique to be on that. And then, um, choosing other members internally to support. This is to develop the RFP, which then we would vote on the RFP. So for instance, Commissioner Cameron, you would see whether the specifications focus on the, what you particularly value um, for what the executive uh, 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 firm would, would do. So we would have input at even that juncture and vote on the RFP, which would then issue. So there would be two steps where we would have a say, and then ultimately the final two, the selection of the firm, they would come back, like we've seen that with the recommendation. But what we haven't done in the past necessarily is actually vote on the RFP itself. It becomes a public record, so we would be seeing it right before it becomes a public record, and voting on ratifying it. Or but we would have input. If that, I just wanted to, I'm, I'm just trying to remember those pieces where we would all right. have touches. Right. Yeah, no, and at multiple, t uh, at critical different times, um, you know, we could discuss at, a, at an open meeting uh, uh, either revisions, uh, in, um, in edits to uh, the job description uh, or whatnot. Uh, so that clearly is in the, in the realm of possibilities. Are we just updating now, or are we discussing the merits of either way? Yeah, yeah I think we should discuss yeah. the merits of either way. Yeah. Uh, there is, I could. Yes. I think we've had limited result, limited uh, or mixed results in the past when we've hired executive search firms. That's my recollection. Um, I think what is really important is um, that we can't forget is all of the publications and organizations that are out there um, that are gaming related. I think that would be important to go with, um, I, I think that's where most of the folks in this industry go to. There are professional organizations, IAGRA, IMGL, um, as well as some of the uh, publications. I actually think that's an important piece that could bring, uh, bring value to the process. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I would just, I would add to that. Um, Obviously, it's been noted we've been through this twice before. The first time we used a search firm, um, it was, I think it was helpful. I think at the stage of the agency's life, we might have not had the bandwidth to, uh, to necessarily undertake the search ourselves, uh, just in terms of staffing and everything else that was, was uh, piled on our to-do list. Um, 
the second time around, we used, uh, we did not use the search firm, we used you know, the capabilities of our HR department. So as we think of this, I would also you know, inquire to our HR staff to come up with a plan of what they would do to try to get us to the same point. You know, the publication was using LinkedIn, a number of those things, uh, just, in, just so we can you know, compare both approaches and, and what uh, a search firm would be able to bring to the table. So, uh, again, and I think the second, you know, first time around we had a great group of candidates. Um, you know, the search firm added value because they really went out and kind of beat the bushes and maybe marketed candidates um, extremely effectively to people that may not have been touched by, you know, seeing the job post. Uh, and conversely, the second time around, you know, using our internal team, uh, you know, I, I think the 10 or 12 candidates that we actually had one-on-one -on -one interviews all came from, you know, the game or some type of regulatory background. So I think both options have their benefits. So if I could add, um, I've given this some thought and perhaps maybe um, I mean being a newcomer, so we don't really, we're not really tied to the past. Um, I have thought about the juncture at which we are at, and it is a different place in time than when we were looking for an executive director, which allows us an opportunity to pause. If we use strictly internal resources, we, um, would, we, would, we might be able to gain some efficiencies and, and certainly cost savings. My hope will be whatever, whatever uh, vehicle we choose, that when we are developing a job description and candidate profile, we have really done a thorough review internally all the way from commissioners down through all levels of employment to say, what would you value? Uh, what is this a time for some culture shifts? Is this a time for mission re-examination? What strengths um, would you want in the executive director now? It may be status quo, so don't presume my um, inquiry to be anything to say affirmatively needs to change. My concern about using strictly internal resources is that folks may be less candid if they are reporting to folks who they work with. And having, even if we use a hybrid where we used a consultant or somebody with, who has really the capacity to assess an organization's needs at a juncture for leadership, um, that, they, that they do that to help us make sure when we post that job description, we will get the candidates we want. And that includes internal candidates. And that's my second reason. If we have any internal candidates, it will be extremely important to maintain confidentiality. And if we use internal resources strictly, we will not be able to necessarily keep that in a, in a confidential. We also will lose the expertise we get from an outside perspective. When we, an outside perspective, um, you know, we're, we're great as a group, but boy, another couple of brains can be really helpful. So I would advocate at the very least of a hybrid approach, I would prefer um, to use the, an expert in this. And I, I just happen to have come off from a very successful search for the, uh, I sit on a board of trustees and the head of school has shifted. Um, we have more restraints because of the open meeting law, but it was very much uh, still an open process because school, you know, schools have to you know, ultimately interview publicly, et cetera. Um, and, and I, we had a very different experience uh, with our executive um, uh, search firm. So I, I, I guess I would just say, um, in light of confidentiality issues around the opportunity to have somebody help us assess, I'd recommend some. And we also have a very small, we don't have much bandwidth. Um, Trifty is sitting here, and Natasha is in Springfield. And uh, so the bandwidth that's required to to go for a, a position of this 
Sports um, caliber. It's a big position. It is a big position. Um, I think uh, Executive Director Petrosian knows that it's a big position. And so uh, I think we should make sure to treat it as such and also um, make sure, that, of course, that we're careful around resources too. In terms of timelines, I'm one for putting in a contract deliverables and timelines and keeping them to that. In many ways, we could control that even perhaps more than our own internal resources. Those are my pros and cons. The, the, the pro of having it done, of course, internally would be that, you know, a Troop D has awareness of our mission and our culture. Um, it would cost less. It might cost internally because we'd be stretching internal resources. Um, and we would have perhaps more control over timeline unless we have a series of vacations or something. Then it would be less control. I, I, just real quick, I want to pick up a, a, a great point that you made, which is uh, uh, where we find ourselves at the time of this search as compared to the previous two, and it's been referenced, the good people we have and the good work that they do, and uh, you know, we've talked in not only about it at this meeting, but previous meetings in terms of the iteration of the life of this commission. Uh, and you talked about, you know, as we develop the the latest version of the job description is to take an opportunity to sit down with our employees informally as departments or as groups um, to get their feedback. They have a different interaction with the executive director than we do. Um, they also have a sense of kind of now that we've opened three casinos, kind of where some of the challenges might lie ahead. Uh, and they might have suggestions as to what they might look for uh, in the past. You know, we brought in a candidate that had a chance to meet the team, but um, uh, I think it would be good for us to, to get their input into the job description. Uh, you know, the basics are gonna be there, but some nuances that, again, uh, they might be able to offer as we look at where we are. We are in a steady state of business. What skills do they think might be helpful to the overall organization? I think that feedback, to your point, Madam Chair, is helpful. Yeah, I would agree with that, that um, input from staff is critical. And I think we have developed a culture here where people aren't afraid to speak up. I don't think folks will be um, afraid to share their opinions because it's opinions about what you think is important to the organization. So I, I don't have a sense that people would be hesitant to share that information. Um, and uh, the other piece is I, I, I do believe our HR um, you know, they, they're very capable of, uh, of keeping matters confidential. So I do, um, I'm not as concerned about those two aspects. And I do understand the value. I guess I just haven't had uh, as positive an experience with a search firm. Um, I just really, um, you know, especially one that did not know the gaming world. It is, it is pretty small, the group. and. Um, the other piece I think is important is we are well respected as regulators now around the world for many of the different things that we've done. And I think that is an attractive piece. Very different when we were new and no one knew anything about us um, or what we were going to yeah, do. Yeah, no, if, if, um, if I could just continue on that, uh, the contrast, I guess, of where we are in the life cycle, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of um, Initially, uh, because we were, all, we were yes. really new, and uh, and there was clearly a bandwidth uh, uh, concern, but there was also a um, an element of we really needed uh, gaming experience. There have been five mm -hmm. new commissioners with expertise in, in in other areas except gaming. A lot of them very relevant, public policy and investigations and whatnot. Um, but there was this notion of really the gaming regulatory background that, uh, that, we, that we valued at the time. And we knew that was going to be almost by definition out of state. And, um, and hence, you know, it really um, sounded and, 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 and turned out to be uh, a nationwide sort of type of approach. Um, that was less, those two elements were less of a concern when we came uh, the second time around. We did by, the t by then 
had already acquired significant uh, gaming experience uh, in, regula in regulatory um, um, uh, matters uh, from New Jersey and, 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 and other, other, other areas. So, um, and we had also, uh, we were also staffed uh, with, with internal resources that, uh, that, that really allowed us. Um, I do think that the, uh, the point you make is the central one, uh, Chair, and that is whether we think, um, whether we value uh, more, uh, or, or whether we put a premium, let me put it that way, on somebody at this juncture to come in and offer uh, an outside perspective, uh, one that could have a, a, a facilitated type of approach towards gathering what's uh, what's most uh, uh, what what are the priorities, let's say, for uh, to look for in an individual or or uh, as as and how they reflect on the organization. Um, you know, versus you know, trying to look ourselves at ourselves in, in the mirror and try to do that. I, I don't. I don't. I think it's a judgment call ultimately, um, and 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 I think that's that's where the difference uh, relies. I um, I am a particularly budget conscious. Uh, uh, I should admit uh, when it comes to any decisions that we make, uh, but I think um, that should not be the driver when it comes to to this to this particular matter. I think. Uh, you know, having a limited time of, of uh, a professional service, a couple of people, one or however many, end up dedicating to this, uh, may end up being, you know, a bit of a, a wash when it comes to, you know, what we might gain. Uh, uh, but ultimately, it's whether we really uh, place a premium on having somebody from, from outside give us, you know, feedback, uh, is, is my opinion. Thank you. Uh, I think for me personally, um, that was helpful because one of my questions was why the decision not to use a search firm the second time around and does the same circumstance exist now? And then I just think personally, individually, I'll sit down with Tripti. I'd like to know, just walk me through what happened the last time because I think unless I have an understanding of the, of the, the mechanism the last time, I'm not really going to have an opinion on it in terms of whether it's, to your point, I'm, I'm not like you, but I'm close second probably to thinking about the cost of it and the value add to it. Um, I'm not as convinced of um, being as concerned about confidentiality. I feel like that that's something that can be addressed and, and I don't think would dissuade anyone. Because um, even with using someone from the outside in terms of the possibility of just inside talk, et cetera, exists, I'm not so sure it obviates that. Um, but I would, I think before I go any further in terms of what I'm thinking, I want to know more what exactly was the last uh, the so, last one, so and then also, if I could just finish, it, it may, I think, did you, were you the one, the point person with the search firm? Yes. The yep. first time? Yep. Just talk to you about your experience also, probably one-on-one, -on -one in terms of um, what you felt like your interactions were with the firm and how that works, too. That probably is my jumping off point. And just to be clear, that how um, Bruce did it the first time would be the structure that I'd be recommending, mm -hmm. if we do inclusive, would ultimately be quite different because... Um, you didn't use the tool that's available to the executive session for preliminary screening committee, so you could at least have two commissioners be part of um, the, the interview's first round. And I would recommend that, you know, I have asked Enrique um, to, to help on that front. I would ask another commissioner, if you decided that was the way you would go, to see if they, you know, somebody else would be willing to do the first round interviews. Of course, the, we all know that the finalists would have to be interviewed in public um, and typically in that kind of preliminary screening committee you do use your executive search firm expertise those experts would be sitting there and helping you guide um, I mean I have had you know, this this would be you know, I have been engaged in executive search uh, searches a few times throughout my career and I have not ever just use internal resources. So it seems I'm, I'm, I'm quite in a different position than you because mm -hmm. um, it's so important to make sure that uh, internal candidates feel comfortable, outside candidates feel it's fair and objective, and so it, it, it is um, for such a big position. You know, it's a big, it is a big position. It's mm -hmm. a um, well-compensated position, too. So. I also do think we have a high profile in terms of the existence of the vacancy that some other um, entities may not have. So that kind of comes into my thinking too. 
In which way, though, because of that, do you think that that the need for greater reach out may not be, exist as it may oh. in some other <clears throat> industries? Yeah. I don't know, but that's something. Well, what, one thing that I, it, it, it sounds like, Commissioner, you would want to come back and try to make this decision at a later commission meeting? Is that? Yes, because that, I'm, I, I have you? not done any sort of uh -huh. participate in a search at that level. Yeah. And for me, <coughs> it is really getting an understanding of how was it done the last okay. time and should we do it differently and why. So would you want to then postpone these decisions? I think we um, postpone and then we get some input. I think it's great input to get um, because I've done a little bit of footwork just because of where I'm sitting and um, learned. I, I still don't know all the details of what's mm -hmm. happened in the past. Um, I did say in, in the event that we had reached a consensus, I was going to ask for an internal you know, report timeline and a work plan on how it would be conducted. Uh, and one thing I think that I would truly very much welcome would be um, to understand if you were going to do um, Commissioner Cameron suggests if we did it internally, how would you secure from our staff all the way through um, uh, information that's really helpful? I would use a consultant to do focus groups in a way that everybody feels safe and sound to be able to express what they think is important. And again, the outcome could be just where we are now. That's the hybrid model you mentioned. Well, say. that would be, I mean, that would be, a con the consultant would be the executive search firm. If we don't want to do that for the end, we could consider, but I do think as much as the ultimate choice and who, and the fact that we might have a high profile mm -hmm. and we can get candidates, what's probably what I'm suggesting here is a chance to everybody pause, everybody get on board for our, our, our big change right now. Mm -hmm. With that said, you were at different junctures then, and so we need more input. And we can, Derek Trippi can explain what happened in the past. You can describe the timeline that it took, the resources it took for you internally, what the executive uh, search firm, how you found that. We can get some input, but if you could stick to having this for next next big meeting. Mm -hmm. Oh, Derek. Yeah. Just just one consideration to address a few things, because uh, I know Trippi will tell you it can get done no matter what. Um, the low bandwidth within the HR department is a concern. Um, we are understaffed. We didn't fill our um, backfill that left. We've had 33% turnover in the last year as far as vacant filling vacant positions, and we will have the racing season opening up at the same time, so there'll be onboarding and offboarding at that point. Um, so whatever decision we make, we just need to let everyone know what the priorities are so if this is going to be the priority, um, then we have to let other people know about their backfills and vacancies hold off. Or if we go the other route, then Troopy will be there for process, more like she was the last time around, because Bruce and Janice did a lot of the focus groups, um, and then we did the back end um, side. But knowing that, that's another resource um, that isn't there right now. Janice isn't here. We handle a lot of the focus groups. Catherine was a big player in that part, too. She is in a contract basis. <laughs> yeah, no, I, if I can only um, perhaps clarify a little bit more, but, but it, it's, it, it seems like it's understood. The notion of a hybrid model uh, uh, really is um, retaining any uh, firm, executive search or purely management consultants, for example, uh, to help in, in any uh, um, part of the process, uh, however expansive or limited we, we would want to do it. It occurs to me that you know the time to do that would be at, at a minimum initially to, to do that, those uh, focus groups, conversations that might be, that might benefit a lot more from that in, independent perspective, um, where ultimately the decision making really is where, uh, where, where, we, where we all at the tail end uh, become a lot more uh, involved. Another thing that I would also uh, point out that um, uh, is um, hopefully a, a given, but uh, uh, but really part of ver very much the way that uh, the last one went about, and that is to um, at least uh, attempt to have two finalists come and be interviewed by the full commission, uh, which I know uh, can dissuade some candidates, uh, but 
it's been done it's been done before we did not benefit from that the very first time around uh, i understand there was a finalist that at the very end just withdrew his uh, her consideration uh, for that very reason it's not it's not easy to you know be in front of a camera with a transcript that uh, you know uh, uh, talking about yourself and, and whatnot but um but i think uh, that is that is an assumption that we should we should really um, strive to uh, uh, accomplish here um, and as you pointed out uh, chair we did not avail ourselves of that uh, screening uh, uh, opportunity in in the past uh, which may or may not uh, um, add uh, rather help in this uh, finalist uh, conversation or not but that's yet another option that we could uh, uh, that's available mm -hmm. so we'll postpone this decision get um, do some more due diligence get further information you can maybe circle back to folks um, Commissioner O'Brien for your specific questions and the rest of us can get clarification where we need clarification to think about um, next steps and making sure that the process is a, is a, is a good one. Um, and we appreciate everyone's patience as we, um, we uh, go through this process. I, it is my hope always to be as efficient as we can uh, to keep um, these processes moving along so that um, folks um, know what the, the, the program is and what they can expect especially as we we may have um, you know there'll be continuing uh, work challenges that we want to make sure we're stable and ready for us thank you moving on to the next item then commissioner cameron do you want to just give a little update on the iac i do thank you so as we mentioned earlier at a couple of meetings we are hosting the international gaming uh, uh, regulators conference which this year will be a joint conference um, to include the international masters of gaming law as well uh, we were recruited to host um, for for IAGRA and um, shortly after that IMGL said you know Boston's a great location can we do a jo joint conference which was done about four years ago so that um, has has happened this conference will be the week of september 20th through the 25th um, of of 2020 so next fall the end of september we will be hosting and um, that is the boston marriott copley place there was a bid process and that was the most uh, attractive bid to the groups the two groups combined groups who are putting these uh, two conferences together combined conference one day will be a joint um, uh, day with all of the participants. The early end of the conference will focus with uh, IAGRA. The later end, the latter end rather, will be a more of the IMGL. Um, we are fortunate to have our interim uh, interim uh, executive director Karen Wells. She was elected to the IAGRA board um, at the last conference, and um, there are only two Americans serving on this board in this capacity. So it really is an honor for. Director Wells, as well as uh, our commission to have her selected to uh, serve on the board in this capacity. And um, so both organizations will really strive to bring together, um, you know, the international gaming regulators from around the world, legal advisors, and key stakeholders. And so it really is an opportunity um, through speakers, through discussion, to talk about emerging issues. Um, share information about regulatory policy. I find that so interesting to, to really learn how the rest of uh, the world is regulating. And certainly the latest research, which I think will have a, uh, an ability to contribute in that field, and uh, industry developments and trends. So um, both committees now are working on the substance of the conference. You know, there's still some decisions about dinners and, and whatnot where they'll be held, but for the most part, we have a site, we know we're hosting, and the group is working. Uh, the name of this year, next this year's conference will be Disrupting the Regulator. Um, and really what that means is, is a focus on disruption and sparking regulatory innovation. Um, you know, 
efficiencies, effectiveness, um, global regulations. So that's kind of a, I think it's well used today, right? Disruption, but that that is really what the focus will be this year. As we speak, there is a call for speakers. This is a new, um, fairly new piece to the conference. I think as with many conferences we've all been involved with over the years, you're kind of, oh, so-and-so would be great. So-and-so would be good on this panel. And this call for speakers was really, really effective. We had a high quality of speakers in Jamaica because others saw the opportunity and saw the um, that may not have been contacted, that may not have uh, been on anyone's radar screen. So it was a different group and, and a really substantive group. So that piece is happening now. That's the piece I really wanted to talk about because I think um, people here, people in Massachusetts and others that we've worked with could really contribute. And so um, I've spoken to Director Driscoll about getting this up on our website so that people can easily find this call for speakers. And um, just, just to note some of the topics of interest. Um, we just mentioned regulatory disruption, some case studies, some lessons. Enhancing risk-based supervision, player protection, regulating emerging technologies, um, certainly responsible gaming innovation, um, some international standards and um, kind of mutual recognition, leading investigations in, in interviewing approaches. Um, there's just so many topics and the conference planners are always looking for new topic, topics. These are just suggestions. And I think this is an opportunity that people should be aware of, which is why I wanted to mention it today. Um, you know, it's the ability to uh, have an impact and really influence policymakers, regulatory leaders, stakeholders in the industry. Um, it is an opportunity. So again, that link will be up on our website and there's a submission form um, with the topic and the kinds of things you'd like to talk about and whether or not you'd be interested in a, in a, um, in a panel discussion or a keynote presentation. There are a, a couple of different opportunities. But that is the piece that I, and I think that's the end of February, they would like those submissions. So I, I guess I'm asking all of you to think about your areas of expertise, um, where we could add tremendous value to this, uh, this group of speakers um, by some of the people we've worked with, some of our own people who have done tremendous work. Um, so I just, that will be up there. So please encourage people to take a look, and I've been doing it already. Um, I know Director Wells will get more involved with this now that she, in her spare time, um, now that she um, is, is a board member. Do you have anything else to add to that, Director? No, just I think that uh, Boston as a venue for this uh, conference is going to be fantastic. I know Janice is going to be working on uh, some of the activities and be an opportunity, also some little economic development for the area because they'll be bringing a lot of people in and uh, they'll be able to use the restaurants, go to events. Uh, very, how, very diverse group. How many, do they, how many um, folks have they usually get? It's, I'm giving September 20, 20th through the 25th, and that those five days uh, are both conferences. So there will be some people that will come for the first end and participate in the joint day. There will be others. But there are a lot of folks that belong to both organizations and who will come for the week. So. Um, if, if I could um, just mention, um, one of the um, there are a number of topics that you that you mentioned already uh, and alluded to uh, that um, if we were to relate them to Massachusetts, uh, which would be a perfect location, uh, there's a great story to tell there. Uh, we, although I've never been to the IAGRA conference and, and look forward to going to this this year, uh, the conferences that I've attended that make use of panels with a bit of a multi-discipline um, uh, or background uh, are, in my opinion, hugely effective and, 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 you know, they generate quite a bit of interest. Mm -hmm. uh, it occurs to me that, um, you know, a regulator, researcher, advocate, you know, advocate, um, and even licensee on, around the topics of research, responsible gaming, and economic development, uh, specifically to the Massachusetts you know, history or, or, or um, recent story would be very relevant and I, I would hope that they would be 
very well considered to be. Uh, Which is why I'm yeah. encouraging absolutely all of us to think about who do, you know. How do we let people know? Hey, this I yes. think you'd be great. Um, this is the um, this is the format. Go, go ahead and apply to be a speaker. Mm -hmm. And we will have input as to what the panels will look like, yeah. um, and and how to how we can add value. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I can think of already a number of uh, people in the Public Health Trust Fund, right. uh, Responsible Gaming and, and Game Sense, uh, you know, world, really, mm -hmm. that have presented before, and mm -hmm. some of these conferences that I alluded to that would be uh, very happy to collaborate in something uh, mm -hmm. of this uh, visibility. So, it, it, but it's a good occasion to mention, you mentioned it's the end of February, that it's the, the deadline yes. for this uh, submission. It seems a bit early for me, but... Yeah. I have a conference call tomorrow, and I'll ask that question, is that a yeah. hard and fast deadline yeah. for speakers? Yeah. Um, but yes, that's what they're advertising right now. Yeah. Is, uh, is well, they need to plan yeah. as well. Yeah. Right. You know, it might be an interesting opportunity for our three licensees to come forward mm. and talk about the yes. Massachusetts regulatory climate. We have companies that obviously operate in many jurisdictions domestically and globally. Mm -hmm. Give them a chance to talk about what their impact has been and why they chose to enter the, you know, the fray to compete for a license in Massachusetts. They're going to be here, little focus on, mm -hmm. on their success in the state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lots of lots of opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. That's it. Great. Thank Jim, you. You'll just keep us um, updated I will. along the way. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you for the appreciate opportunity. It. It's a it's a really uh, nice opportunity for us to spotlight the Commonwealth and, and the city of Boston as an exciting venue for these kinds of conferences. It will be easy. It's a September day. Knock on wood. Uh, Boston in September can be spectacular. So, um, great. And a really exciting topic, I think. Um, <clears throat> before I move um, for any kind of a motion to adjourn, um, I want to I have two matters under other business that I didn't reasonably anticipate. Well, one is to thank um, Jacqueline and Marianne and Jamie and Shara and Austin because this is our first um, commission meeting in this new year and it went timely and everyone has been able to do their job because of you. So thank you. Jacqueline, thank you. Um, and second, uh, I didn't reasonably anticipate this, um, this next bit of business because who can reasonably anticipate the departure of an executive director who has been here for four years shepherding um, all of you um, this wonderful staff and um, shepherding the uh, successful launching of two massive uh, resort destination casinos. So this is the time we would like to do that um, and recognize uh, Executive Director Bedrosian. We deferred earlier and thank you for your patience. <laughs> Alrighty, who would like to begin? I'll start. Um, so it's been terrific for me for the last four years for the commission. Uh, I, I believe we had strong leadership. We had compassionate leadership. We really cared about employees, and that's that's something you don't always see in a leadership position. And that was something I took note of. And even before um, Executive Director Bedrosian was. Um, there was there was no uh, position available, but we just were starting this commission, and um, Ed was over at the Attorney General's office as the first assistant, and he couldn't have been more helpful to us. And I'll always remember that because we were scrambling, right? We had to hire lots of people. Uh, we had to make sure our regulations were, um, you know, what we thought they should be. There were just so many issues right out of the box, and Ed was really terrific in in helping. He sat in and did interviews with us. He'd give us a heads up, mm, watched your meeting today, got to be careful about this or that. I mean, um, making sure we had a strong relationship with the Attorney General's office and all of our appointing authorities, which was important to all of us. So 
the front end was really important and to watch this organization grow over the last four years under Ed's leadership um, I think is um, something noteworthy and I want to thank you and certainly we will miss you. Thank you. Yeah, no, uh, same, uh, same feeling. I think um, looking back at your tenure, the way you started to, um, to um, outline it earlier in the meeting today, it's really bookended by very important uh, milestones. Uh, it includes significant uh, developments for this agency, uh, very important decisions that we had to make and rely on your leadership to help us, help us do that. Um, I remember um, as well when uh, the, perhaps your first the interview that we did publicly that uh, you mentioned you saw yourself as a traffic cop, um, and uh, which is which is key because this is a very unique uh, structure that we have here, reporting to five people, uh, but having to manage in between meetings a number of things, not just with those five people, but critically with with the rest of the agency, and that's a really uh, it occurred to me that it's a traffic cop in one of those Boston intersections that are going all over the place. You know, uh, what's the that, one in Somerville that, that no know. one listens to? Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, and uh, but but as as Commissioner Cameron was saying, uh, important to recognize that you gotta give leeway to people and uh, to directors and others to do their job, um, stay out of the way where where you need to, and then come in and and try to implement um, you know the oftentimes competing directives of five people uh, uh, that, that you report to uh, in a way that is balanced and ultimately which is a successful outcome so um, I think it's um, it's it's a challenge uh, it, it, that we'll continue to live with uh, regardless who, who is in, in, in that position uh, it's perhaps easy to say well I would do something slightly different of what that he's doing, uh, but I think what is often missed is all the things that nobody sees that are either avoided or addressed timely or uh, somehow uh, eventually successfully addressed and keeping us on, on time that people don't always see that are really important and valuable, and for that we will miss you. Thank you. I, w I wasn't going to use the word traffic cop, I was thinking more herder of cats. Um, but now you can use traffic cop. I'm thinking of the iconic cop who danced while he was directing traffic. Um, now, I want to thank Ed for the, his last few years at the helm uh, and his leadership. Um, and Commissioner Cameron pointed something out when you're, you're working with the team, you're working uh, some long nights prior to opening, that you're there with everybody. Um, and I think that was critically important. Um, uh, you've been great to work with. Uh, you have kept all of us informed. You made time for all five of your bosses, um, keeping us in the loop, stepping in when you needed to. Um, I'm actually wearing colorful socks in your honor, but I won't flash those on television. Um, I, I think the thing that has really impressed me is that even though we are a regulator, our uh, regulatees have never been reluctant to pick up the phone and reach out to you personally. And it has helped bring a lot of problems to our awareness, help solve a lot of problems. Uh, but the comfort level that they established with you to understand what your role was, but at the same time know that uh, you know they had a very capable listener on the other end of the phone, I think has really made uh, a number of uh, what could have been explosions just turned out to be some minor bumps in the road. Um, and I think that's a credit to, to how you approach the job and your own personality. So um, I wish you good luck. Um, certainly have enjoyed working with you and, uh, and know you still might become a familiar face to us. But thank you. So um, this is the third time I've been in a going away party where you and I have been together. It's usually me leaving. So this is the first time that I'm saying goodbye to you in this capacity. Um, but you were one of the first people that I spoke to after I got appointed. Um, one of the few people that I knew already when I got here. Um, and was 
consistent with what everyone said about how you treat people, et cetera. I, I've, I've always found you to be very respectful and open and candid, and it was very helpful to me um, to know that that relationship was the same and continued and that you could be very honest with me and I could be honest with you. Um, I found you to be um, accessible on everything, honest about everything, up to date on everything. Um, I'll save any other war stories for <laughs> after. Um, <laughs> probably more appropriate but I, I also have a feeling given how often we've crossed paths that this is not the last time that we'll be sitting in this dynamic so I'm not actually going to say goodbye to you so much as to say I will see you soon because I'm sure that I will um, not only in the job that you're taking but probably in years to come at other um, state agencies or beyond so I wish you well and I'm sure that we will um, see you soon thank you so it's funny um, when I was thinking that my first time I would have encountered Ed was here, but in, and that is true in person. However, we did try to meet each other in our former positions and to have coffee. He was first assistant at the Attorney General's office. I was general counsel at the Treasury. There was work that we really had to do together on debt management, as you well know, and it just made sense that we meet. And we would go back and forth and we would not connect and I finally said to Ed look I think we're getting on the elevator together and I don't know who you are so we never met on the elevator or for coffee because he left um, too soon up in the AG's office so I knew that I would be now um, not having to worry about getting to know him uh, on the elevator so my path didn't actually cross we escaped meeting um, Ed, of course, has an impeccable reputation with all the external uh, folks, our licensees admire all that he has brought to them in terms of coming here and, and uh, setting up their businesses here. Uh, they have all been in touch with me to let me know. Um, I reached out, of course, to let them know of your resignation and, of course, the interim appointment um, of uh, Director Wells. and not surprising to a person that uh, they, they got back with such complimentary words. And uh, I've had the, you know, the benefit of sending out messages to folks here so you know how I feel. Um, you know, Ed is, uh, his strength is to, with, with few words, few questions, uh, keep things rolling. But what I have observed, and I have said it now several times, is what I admire most um, as the leadership quality of Ed is that he has such unwavering confidence in all of you and the staff. And um, he's a smart man because he knows his success has been because of the team. But we're also smart up here, and we know that it takes a great leader to get the very best. Um, we thank you for that, Ed, um, and I know that uh, we'll probably be saying, what would Ed do um, over the next few weeks? And Karen, I suspect you have his phone number handy. So with that, I, I would, unless we have some more words, um, I would like to awkwardly welcome Ed to the front because we want to make sure we capture, Austin will capture us somehow. Uh, this is where I like being chair, because I get to make these presentations. I could delegate it away, but I'm not going to. This is the fun part of the job. Come on over. I think he's going to have a fancy new office to hang this in, and we're going to come check it out. It better be in a prominent spot. Like, like or the basement. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm hoping I can read this okay. Um, it says, on this ninth day of January 2020, the Massachusetts Gaming Commission proudly presents this Distinguished Service Award to Edward R. Bedrosian, Jr. In grateful appreciation of his distinguished service to the Massachusetts Gaming Commission and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Ed's leadership over the past four years as executive director has been instrumental in guiding complex regulatory preparations 
to ensure the successful opening of the MGM Springfield and Encore Boston Harbor. The Commission appreciates all he has done for commissioners, MGC staff, and MGC's many stakeholders. The MGC would like to thank Ed for consistently encouraging staff to meet and exceed demanding professional responsibilities and extends its sincere gratitude for his leadership, professionalism, and his many years of dedicated service to the Commonwealth. We wish you luck. Ed, there's a microphone here. Just don't let that. So uh, I would like to start by formally uh, adopting the comments I made in the morning for the record. Um, I'm not going to say much beyond them. Um, they will exist in perpetuity. Um, but again, I look out over all of you and um, thank you. That's all I can really say. Uh, it's been a privilege and an honor, and um, uh, but it wasn't. It wasn't my. It was my privilege to work with you, um, but it was my privilege to watch you work. Um, you know, the folks here. Um, we had some interesting, trying times that no one ever could have predicted, and yet uh, you all stayed the course, and the commission stayed the course also. I mean, there, there was a lot of reason, especially early on, when there was not necessarily a divide between, but there was a lot of work happening at staff that the commission just had to trust was being done for particular reasons, whether it was a licensing reason or not. And they gave staff that confidence. And that's a big ask. And, um, and I appreciate that. Um, and you all stepped up and deserved it. And so I, I really appreciate that. And no matter. I think what I, I do in life, and I hope to have other successes, um, I will look back on this particular time and think of all of you and be very proud. So thank you. So um, there will be cake. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn this meeting? So moved. All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? Would that be an opposition from anyone? Okay. Thank you, everyone. Five zero.